Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 10th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, that is, the convener moves to his mobile phone to turn it off. Uh, as um, papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members uh, during the meeting. We've got a full house today. No apologies have been received. And we move straight to agenda item one, which is the Planning Scotland Bill. And the committee will take evidence on the bill at stage one. And can I welcome Kevin Short, Minister for Local Government and Housing, Joe McNearly, Chief Planner, uh, Andy Kinnear, Bill Manager, and Norman McLeod, Senior Principal Legal Officer, Scottish Government. Can I welcome all of you for coming along here this morning and can invite the Minister to make some opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, the planning bill is one uh, element, uh, a vital element, of our full programme of review of the planning system. Uh, the bill's content and our intentions for the review as a whole are rooted in the findings and recommendations of an independent panel made up of users of the planning system. Uh, there have been a number of drivers for the planning review from the beginning. Uh, the need to deliver more housing, uh, the need to improve the experience and influence of our communities, uh, the effectiveness of development planning and leading positive change in our places, uh, the need for more proactive management of development and the need for strong leadership and better management of skills and resources. Uh, we have maintained our focus on all of these drivers throughout, uh, and we are taking forward the vast majority uh, of the panel's recommendations. Uh, we are not starting from scratch. Uh, much of the existing planning system will remain, uh, for example, the requirement for development planning to contribute to the principles of sustainable development uh, will continue. Uh, but we are proposing changes which will radically reform the way planning is done in Scotland. The bill is certainly more than just tinkering. Uh, it will lead uh, an essential shift in our planning services away from a largely regulatory function, uh, stripping back unnecessary process uh, to facilitate the delivery of good quality development and the great places our communities deserve. Our reforms for development planning, for example, uh, will enable greater clarity for all about the future direction of development and free up planners and stakeholders uh, from the continuous cycle of plan writing uh, to working together on plan de delivery. Uh, the bill pursues a continued drive for better upfront collaboration uh, involving people from the outset in the choices that need to be made about future development. Uh, local place plans will give people a greater opportunity uh, to come together to discuss, consider and express their aspirations and a chance to have real influence over the future of their places. I accept that there are mixed views about appeal rights. Uh, I've considered the issues and I agree entirely uh, with the independent panel. Stronger community engagement at an early stage is much more constructive than more adversarial appeals at the end. I want our reforms to remove conflict, mistrust and tactics from the system. Better early collaboration by all is the way to go. Uh, Scotland needs investment in good development for our communities and our planning system. Uh, it should, of course, facilitate that. The bill should not bring further complexity, process and uncertainty to those who may want to invest in Scotland. Uh, the reforms must lead to improved performance and to a more positive, proactive and confident planning system. Our proposals for increased resources, skills development and performance improvement uh, will bring a supportive approach, encouraging the whole planning service to function well. Uh, while the legislation uh, focuses on process, uh, we will also progress work on National Planning Framework 4, incorporating Scottish planning policy uh, following on from the bill. Uh, this will involve thorough collaboration and scrutiny over important priorities in national planning policy. I hope, Convener, that this provides a useful context uh, to inform our discussion today. Uh, I'm looking forward to discussing this bill with you this morning and to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. That's welcome. I will move to questions now. Andy White. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and thank you, Minister, uh, 
for coming along this morning. Um, you've laid out at the beginning some of what you call the drivers uh, of the bill. Our job as a committee is to scrutinise this bill and to report to Parliament on the general principles of the bill. I wonder if you could say uh, what are the general principles of this bill? Um, convener, um, as I said in my opening remarks, um, the uh, government uh, commissioned an independent uh, review of planning uh, to look at planning as a whole, um, a root and branch review in 2016. Um, the review itself uh, looked at the system as a whole uh, and concluded that the planning system isn't broken, uh, but that change is needed to make it more efficient and more effective. Uh, the panel said that the vision underpinning the 2006 Act uh, remains valid, that planning should be an enabler of sustainable economic development rather than a regulator. However, they also uh, sought to strengthen um, the system uh, with 48 uh, recommendations um, for change. Uh, many of these recommendations uh, can be achieved through wider changes, uh, for example, uh, from policy to practice, uh, and we are taking these forward uh, alongside the legislation. Uh, but the planning bill itself also has an important role uh, to play in setting the framework for the system as a whole. Uh, building on uh, existing legislation, uh, the bill includes caref carefully uh, targeted changes, uh, which may appear technical, uh, but will play a big role in supporting broader ambitions of planning reform. Uh, right, you, you laid out the independent review and its recommendations. And I'm just wondering if succinctly you can describe the general principles of the bill. I mean, you, 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 your opening remarks could, could stand as that, if you're content with that. Well, my opening remarks stand, convener. Um, obviously, what we want to see is a planning system um, that works uh, for people. Um, I know, as many members do, from um, casework that we have, um, that for many folks, um, the planning system uh, itself um, is a place uh, that is rather confusing. Um, we um, undertook to look at all of this um, uh, following on from the review. I think that removing the processes um, that we have, uh, <coughs> have talked about already to a degree will be helpful uh, in uh, letting folk understand much b better um, the current uh, uh, situation around about planning. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the key elements of all of this for me, as I've said right from the outset, um, from uh, uh, getting this role, is to get to a position uh, where we can intertwine uh, community planning uh, and spatial planning. Community planning has got a huge amount of folk involved in it now um, in many parts of the country. I want the same thing to happen um, for uh, spatial planning too. And I think that intertwining of both uh, can help in that regard. Um, I think the committee itself um, has had evidence and uh, written submissions uh, from a number of folks saying that some of the things that currently go on uh, do not uh, uh, entice people uh, into getting involved. Um, I want that to happen. Um, beyond the bill itself, um, convener, um, there are a no number of other work streams uh, going on, um, including uh, a digital task force because uh, I think that we can use technology uh, much more um, to get m many more people involved. And obviously, in this year of young people, um, I want to see a situation where many more young people are involved in the system, uh, because I think it is important uh, that they have a say in planning for their future, um, rather than, um, in some cases at the moment, uh, where those folks who are involved uh, in, the, in the main are mainly older and settled. Can I, can I, can I just check then? Because, I, Mr Whitewood, I thought you were, you were going to just push a little bit further in relation to... I, I think I've, we're, we're only here for two and a quarter hours. I've, right. I've, I've, I've sought it. And right, yeah. So, so, so if it's where I think you're coming in, Deputy, it would be very helpful if you just come and follow up on a little, little bit of that. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, convener, and I remind the committee that I am a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. Um, so, yeah, just to, to develop um, Andy Whiteman's line of questioning, Minister, so we can be clear, what is the core purpose of planning? What is the core purpose of planning? Um, the core purpose of planning, as I see it, um, is the creation uh, of great places. Um, it is uh, there to ensure that we serve uh, Scotland's communities. Um, it is there to ensure um, that we achieve uh, sustainable economic growth. Uh, it is there to uh, ensure uh, that we have the housing that we need here in Scotland. Um, and it is there uh, to ensure that we have the jobs uh, that we need uh, to ensure that our economy uh, thrives. Uh, that, I think, is the purpose uh, of planning. So we have a planning bill in front of us that doesn't state the core purpose of planning, and we've heard from a number of witnesses that that would be a very sensible uh, addition to, to the bill. Um, we've heard that from the Royal Town Planning Institute, we've heard that from Professor Cliff Haig and others. Um, we've been told that in other countries um, that they have been able to <coughs> say very succinctly what the purpose of planning is. Is that an omission from the bill? Um, I don't think it is an omission from the bill. Um, we um, agree um, that the UN goals are a useful starting point, but uh, more relevant to um, policy rather than primary legislation. Um, there is also uh, already a duty for planning authorities uh, to contribute to sustainable development and exercising their functions as introduced by the 2006 Act. Uh, and there are many different ideas uh, on the purpose of planning. Um, just uh, last week, um, or the week before last, I think, convener, um, I, I, I was at a meeting um, uh, of uh, folks from uh, People and Places. Um, and I think that if you went round the room, um, you would have had different ideas uh, from folks about what the purpose of planning um, actually was. Um, other countries set all of this out in policy um, rather than in legislation. Um, I, I think reaching a definition um, is uh, always uh, going to be extremely difficult. Getting agreement around about that uh, is always going to be difficult. But there are also uh, a number of other situations in terms of uh, legal aspects of this. Um, and I think, uh, if you don't mind, uh, convener, I'll take in uh, Mr. McLeod at this point, who obviously, um, as uh, our legal expert, uh, uh, has uh, a few things that he may wish to add. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my only real observation on this is that while we can all set out no doubt what our purpose of planning is and can be set in policy terms, once it's put in legislation, it will have or ought to have legal effect. And if it has legal effect, then it can be used, um, and maybe people will want it to be used, of course, in uh, challenging decisions and in altering the way things are uh, worked through the planning system through all levels of its process. So we need to be very clear as to getting it right that the purpose of planning was what we wanted it to be, and it would be much harder to amend that uh, than it would be through a policy document. Is the situation that we have here is that there isn't a clear agreed definition of of planning because professor uh, cliff haig who's renowned as an international academic said what is the alternative to having a purpose there are presumably two possibilities one is that there is no purpose in which case why are we doing all of this and the other is that there is a purpose but we are not prepared to say what it is and that is not a great piece of administration so you know is there a, a legal impediment to linking the purpose of planning to the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Is that not a sensible place to start, Mr McLeod? I think, um, I think you know, uh, convener, uh, I mean, I outlined uh, what I see the purpose of planning as being. I don't think that many other folk um, would uh, disagree with many of the things that I um, have said. Um, it is whether um, the uh, situation uh, it should be in uh, uh, in legislation, 
um, or in, in policy. And uh, as uh, um, Mr. Uh, McLeod uh, has outlined in uh, his, uh, his, his way, um, you know, what is the purpose? How do we get to that point? What is the situation if that's challengeable? Um, all of this, um, as Ms Lennon is probably aware, all of these discussions um, uh, arose during the scrutiny of the Planning um, Wales Act 2015. Um, an independent advisory group there recommended the need to introduce a statutory purpose, uh, which the Welsh Government resisted on uh, during early scrutiny. Um, and, you know, um, I think that they had some difficulties um, around about that. Um, here, the, the Law Commission is currently undertaking... A, uh, sorry. The Law Commission in Wales is currently undertaking a review uh, of planning law in Wales uh, with a view of providing recommendations and consolidating and simplifying the law. Um, its consideration of that section of the Planning Wales Act and the proposal relating to the need for a st statutory purpose is set out in a detailed consultation paper issued in November last year. Uh, the Commission suggests that setting out a purpose could cause unnecessary uh, and unhelpful duplication and possible conflict. Um, and, you know, I think that um, uh, the last thing that I want to see um, and others want to see is conflict, uh, because uh, a, a huge uh, part um, of what we are embarking on is trying to remove conflict from the system. Thank you. We're going to have to move on now um, to a new topic. Uh, Mr Simpson. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, uh, Minister, this, this has been described as a, a centralising bill. Um, and I have to say that going through it, it that does appear to be the case. Um, so can, can you point to any part of the bill where powers don't flow to you? Um, I don't think powers flow to me um, at all, um, convener. Um, and uh, I've said previously um, that I'm not the kind of person that goes for a power grab uh, anyway. Um, this is about getting it right um, for um, the people of Scotland here. And that is why um, we have uh, ensured in this bill um, the opportunity for local place plans. It is why um, we have uh, looked at removing um, often confusing uh, process from the system so that we can involve uh, more people uh, in, the planning, uh, uh, in the planning system um, at very early stages. Um, I think that uh, we are on the right track here um, and I would dispute um, that this um, is a centralising bill. Um, I'll bring in, if I may, um, uh, convener, uh, Mr McNearney. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, in terms of looking at the system as a whole, which is what we do, um, and to try and ensure that it, that it works more effectively, I'd simply reflect that um, the introduction of local place plans, the alignment of community and spatial planning, the co-production of the national planning framework, the Strengthening of local review bodies, which uh, from their principle is about returning powers to local government um, from central government, um, and the day-to-day -day, uh, scrutiny of planning cases, you would see that ministers take very few cases just now um, on planning decisions, but that these are examples of the direction of, of travel away from centralisation. Okay. Follow up on some of that, Mr. Simpson? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was a very long way of not answering the question, um, which was, um, can you point to any part of the bill where flat powers uh, don't flow to you? Um, and you haven't answered that. But I'll give you another opportunity before moving on to another area. Uh, maybe Mr. Um, uh, Simpson would like to point out areas where powers do flow to me, um, convener. Well, let, let's just. I mean, I. I I heard the same answer as Mr Simpson. It's not for me to arbitrate between the flow of questioning. Um, if, if, if there's specific examples you want to give of where, where power flows uh, to local communities, it would be good if you put that on the record, uh, Minister. And then if Mr Simpson wants to follow up in relation to that, absolutely. Well, I think the key one where power flows to communities is uh, 
uh, we've actually outlined, and Mr McNearney has uh, outlined as well, um, is uh, local place plans. Um, you know, one of the things which I have said right from the very beginning of this, and I'm, uh, I'm being repetitive, I know, convener, um, is that I want communities uh, to have a say. Um, I want um, spatial <coughs> planning uh, to be intertwined with community planning, which I think uh, allows communities uh, to have that greater say um, in their neighbourhoods um, in areas. Um, so, you know, uh, that's one that I would highlight. Well, yeah, thank you. That, that's it for Minister. Do you want to follow up on some of that, Mr Simpson? Um, I, I don't seem to be getting it anywhere uh, on that uh, line of questioning, so I'll move on to uh, simplify development zones. Um, if that's OK, Medina? Yes, go for it. Good. Um, that actually, it uh, does flow on rather nicely because uh, in, in the bill, um, paragraph 6 of Schedule 5A uh, mean, means that Scottish ministers can at any time direct and set out the terms by which a planning authority must make or alter a scheme, uh, a simplified development zone, uh, which seems to be pretty centralised to me. Um, so one of the questions we've had, and I know you've been asked this uh, at another committee, uh, the, the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, um, one of the concerns <coughs> is that the bill as it stands uh, does not specify um, where these zones uh, cannot be set up. Um, now, I know you've committed to correct that oversight. Uh, that's assuming it is an oversight. Um, so I wonder if you can give us so more details of your thinking on, on that today. Um, convener, um, I uh, wrote to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform <coughs> Committee uh, around about aspects of questioning um, in that regard. Um, Mr um, Simpson um, points out um, a, a part of the bill um, around about powers. Um, uh, and simplified development zones. Um, we, do, we do not uh, envisage at all uh, using this power frequent, frequently. Um, it will be an option to consider uh, when we prepare the delivery programme for MPF uh, and how best to ensure that key sites <coughs> or projects of national or regional importance are managed uh, and brought forward for development in a coordinated way. Um, there may be cases uh, where ministers might think that simplified development zones um, could support housing delivery, for example. Um, and, and the strategic development zone um, approach in Ireland, uh, where the government makes a, an order requiring the planning authority uh, to prepare a, an SDZ scheme and bring it forward with two years from the date of the order, um, has there allowed quality uh, neighbours neighbourhoods to be created uh, to address uh, housing sh shortages? But I would re reiterate, uh, we we would not envisage um, using uh, that power frequently. Um, in terms of the delegated powers um, uh, committee and the letter that I wrote. Um, I think we've agreed with the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's suggestion um, that types of land that may not be included uh, in a simplified development zone uh, should be set out on the face of the bill, uh, with a power uh, to add or remove entries by regulations. Uh, and we undertook, I undertook, uh, to bring forward an amendment uh, to that effect at stage two convener. That's helpful, Mr. Simpson. Yes, uh, you did undertake to do that. Um, that's absolutely right. Um, I, j I just wonder if you could tell us today, um, you know, the, what, what types of land might be included in your amendment. Um, convener, um, I will look at all of this um, very closely indeed. Um, I have given uh, that um, undertaking that I will look at all of this um, at stage two. Um, I will continue um, to have uh, discussions uh, around about this convener uh, and we will um, let you know uh, what uh, we plan to do um, as we come closer to stage two around about that. Right. Okay. Um, Going on to, is it okay to ask another question? On is this? it simplified? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 So, um, going back to the the powers that you would have, 
um, to set up a, a simplified development zone. Um, if you say you wouldn't, you don't see yourself using using them very much. Why do you need them? Um, convener, I think that um, uh, you know there may be issues that arise, um, as <coughs> has happened elsewhere, um, where there may be the ne necessity um, for uh, ministers to become involved in simplified uh, development zones. Um, I, th I find this um, all quite interesting in terms of some of the debate that there's been around about this, um, because some folk including, I think, uh, Mr Simpson, um, have been wanting ministers to become much more involved uh, in the establishment uh, of new towns, um, where legislation actually currently exists under the 1968 Act anyway. Um, so a new town being a huge amount of development, um, Mr Simpson and others want ministers to become more involved in these situations. And yet, Mr Simpson seems not to want us to have the ability um, to intervene to deal with a simplified development zone, uh, which may be uh, in the national interest, um, which would be a much smaller development than a new town, for example. Minister, just because I ask you a question, um, you shouldn't assume I have a particular point of view. We're here to scrutinise. Can, so I, can, no, well, can, can we depersonalise it? Just ask the question, we've got a lot to get through. Well, I'm afraid the Minister mentioned me a number of times, right. um, so I'm just putting him straight, really. Not, not, like, if the committee asks a question... Mr, hang on, hang on, Mr Simpson. We've, well, generally, we've got a lot to get through. I think we want to get through all the nuts and bolts of this bill. We want to do it in a... Both, both those giving evidence and us asking the questions do it in a respectful, straightforward manner. And that goes to everyone around this table, including myself. So if you could ask your question. Uh, it's, it's been us, Convener. OK. So C we'll Convener, if I can just um, clarify around about simplified development zones and this power. Um, this is a, a reserve power um, for ministers in effect. Um, and I would expect the vast bulk of simplified development zones uh, to be led through uh, local development plan commitments. OK, a couple of supplementaries on that. I think it's a very reasonable and valid line of questioning. And, and, and I think a few, of, a few of the members in this committee would like to bring to life how these simplified development zones would be used. So, so for example, is it your anticipation, Minister, that each local authority will, next time they look at their local development plan, you would expect all local authorities to have given detailed consideration as to which parts of their land could be, should be, and will be used as simplified development zones. Is that an expectation you have on the on the passage and delivery of this bill for every local authority? I, I would expect every local authority to make decisions for themselves around about whether they think that simplified development zones um, are required uh, in their um, particular area. Excuse me, okay. um, convener. Um, at this moment in time, as members are well aware, um, we have some pilots going on around about simplified development zones. I think that um, simplified development zones themselves offer, offer up opportunities um, in both urban and rural areas um, uh, to ensure that the right development takes place in the right place. Right, right. Yeah. I know um, that Minister, the committee... Sir, I, I sorry. Ap I apologise for cutting across you. It's because we do have a lot to get through. The specific question is, is there an expectation every local authority will, at the, the drafting of the next development plan, have in it, here is our simplified development zones, here's why I've selected it, or a detailed explanation as to why they haven't selected it? Is that your understanding of what this bill will deliver? I, I would expect local authorities, as the delivers uh, and uh, the makers of local de development plans, uh, to come up uh, with what they think is right for their particular area. It may be some local authorities uh, do not see um, simplified development zones um, as the way forward for them. It may be that other local authorities um, uh, will choose uh, to, to move along the simplified development uh, zone uh, way of doing things. Um, I think that simplified development zones themselves uh, offer up 
a huge amount of opportunity, as I say. I think the pilots uh, themselves will prove that to be the case. Uh, we have seen um, situations in the past with simplified planning zones uh, where um, Hillington and Glasgow springs to mind, uh, where we have seen uh, real moves in terms of uh, sustainable economic growth because that has been in place. Um, but it is up to local authorities themselves uh, to look at what is best for their particular I, I, area. I suppose I, I, I'm pushing at the same question again. So a local authority decides, yes, we're up for a simplified development zone. It's going to be at place A or place B on the map. There's a delineated area. Uh, do ministers have to give approval? Do they have to say, yes, we think you've got the right place, or no, I've got the powers, as Mr Simpson was suggesting, that you've picked the wrong place, we're going to impose it in another place. I'm just trying to bring to life the, what would actually happen. So as long as the local authority decides where the simplified development zone is, is that completely in their democratic gift without government interference? Um, we would not... Um, uh have to approve simplified development zones. It is up to um, uh, the, the, the local authority in that regard. Um, we would have to be, of course, notified if there were objections. Let, let me um, um, uh, be completely and utterly um, upfront about here. I would expect um, that local authorities would in, engage with communities mm -hmm. Um, for preparation of any scheme um, for an area, um, rather than the community uh, having to, to react to that. Um, um, we've built in uh, various opportunities um, for the public to be involved in the preparation um, of simplified development so zone schemes, uh, and we will set out uh, more details of the community engagement requirement on the preparation uh, of these schemes and secondary legislation, um, which will inc in include early engagement, uh, consultation with key agencies, opportunity for formal representations. Um, and ministers um, may, if there are objections out there, may uh, prescribe certain cases uh, where a hearing uh, should be held. I hope that that's helpful to you, convener. No, as I was I'm trying to do the converse, so the expectation is for local authorities proactively seek a, a simplified development zone, you'd anticipate there should be detailed community consultation ahead of confirming that. Other than notification, you wouldn't anticipate ministerial or government involvement at that stage seems to be what you're suggesting. So the converse is where areas, local authorities don't go for simplified development zones, will the Scottish Government go through a trawl of each of these areas to identify whether they've got that right or wrong and there's the need for ministerial involvement? Is that what we'd expect uh, on the passage of this bill? Con convener, as I, I said um, uh, it, in answer to the initial question from Graham uh, Simpson, um, about Scottish ministers having the right to designate um, uh, the need to uh, uh, designate as a, a simplified development zone. I would not um, uh, envisage using that power um, frequently. Um, that would only be used if there was something in the national or regional interest. Um, and all of this, um, as far as I'm concerned, if it's not in the national or regional interest, is a matter for local authorities and, and, and for them to determine. Um, I'll maybe bring in uh, Mr McNearney and see if he has got anything to add to what Mr. I've said. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Mr McNearney. OK, thank you. Um, well, the expectation is that authorities will consider the role that a simplified development zone might have, um, including when they're preparing a local development plan. Um, it's not intended that government would would uh, actively police that, and if an authority decides that there isn't a role in their area for a simplified development zone, that we would be um, questioning that or trying to cut across that. So some authorities will want to promote a simplified development zone. At present, I think there's limited appetite, but as, um, as the pilots develop and people see the benefits, then it is a tool that's there to be used. And the process for simplified development zones will be more straightforward. Currently, there's quite a lot of process around it, although though both the current and proposed um, frameworks are about front-loading. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the interface of central government in this area would be 
I think, quite limited. We see there's potential for the National Planning Framework in certain cases um, to be supported by a simplified development zone, but that's still for consideration. Right, that's helpful. That, that, that was the key part of the answer, the Minister, Mr McNeill. I wanted to know whether the, the government would be proactively policing local authorities who didn't come up with simplified development zones, and the, the answer seems to be that, that that's not the intent. That's what I was trying to, to, to tease out. We've got another supplementary on this from one of Helena. OK, um, in instances where a request is made to a planning authority for a simplified development zone, and that's either refused or there's no answer within within three months, the, 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 the applicant or the, the relevant person can refer that to Scottish ministers. So there would be um, a locus for ministers. So, Minister, you've talked about using your sort of proactive powers sparingly in the national interest, but if a local authority has turned down a request because it doesn't conform with the development plan, and then it lands in front of you because someone has an answer that they don't like or they didn't get an answer within three months. What, what tests will you apply or, or future ministers apply? Because um, I, I know you're very keen to improve the effectiveness of development plans and a, and a plan-led system. Is, is there not scope here for, for conflict in the system? Um, convener, I, I think um, as planning minister, <laughs> Uh, often things uh, cross uh, my desk, um, you know, where um, uh, folk don't get their own way, as Miss Lennon has pointed out. Um, me um, and uh, all of my pre predecessors um, have to uh, wrestle with these kind of things uh, on a, a regular ba basis. Um, obviously, um, as with all other things that uh, cross my desk, um, I would have to consider um, every single situation, any request, okay. very carefully indeed. Um, and we will, of course, um, we will consult on how these procedures would work uh, in practice. Um, I've already said uh, in previous answers um, convener uh, around about the level um, of consultation I would expect uh, for there to be carried out uh, at a local level um, if there was a move to, um, uh, to uh, implement a simplified d development zone. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be part of the considerations that I would make um, if that were uh, if there were ever to be an occasion uh, where something like that was going to cross my desk. Okay, so just to be clear, the introduction of simplified development zones into the bill is actually introducing another um, appeal mechanism where decisions um, can be referred, I think it says referred to ministers, either because SDZ's uh, requests are not granted or there's no decision within three months? Well, uh, the thing is that at this moment in time... Um, uh, is that a yes or a no, Minister? Is that another appeal situation? Well, I, I suppose you could consider it as an appeal situation, yes. Okay. Um, so however, more, more at, the end, at the end of the day, um, Convener, um, what we will do, as I stated in my previous answer uh, to Miss Lennon, is make sure that we consult on how procedures in this regard will work in practice. Thank you. Okay. And another brief supplement on this by Mr Simpson, and then we'll definitely move on, because as I keep saying, this will be just, I'll say it constantly through, that there's a lot to get through. We are going to get through it all. So, Mr Simpson. Yeah. Um, so, if a, if a council um, decides to set up one of these zones for, for whatever reason, um, you, you would still have the power, it's in the bill, to alter a scheme. Why, why would you want to do that? Why can't you just leave councils to do, do what they wish in their own area? I'll take Mr McNair in first, convener, and then I'll come back. Um, so the local authority would prepare the scheme. They might have objections and disagreement. They might hold a hearing. Um, um, and it might then be that the scheme is notified to ministers. And some of the triggers for notification might be similar to they are for um, casework. So something might have a local authority interest, but is significantly contrary to the development plan, for example, and might be notified. And there might be some other reasons why it's notified too. And then ministers would simply um, take the view, should they call it in or, or leave it 
back to the planning authority. So that decision is really just about which level of government should take the decision. If ministers were to call it in, um, then you would expect that that would go to the um, Directorate for Planning and Environmental Appeals, and then the minister would get a recommendation, as he does with major casework. Um, so we don't envisage this, this to be uh, something that is the norm, but you need to provide in legislation um, a framework that allows for all eventualities, even if some of the powers are kind of methods of the last resort, um, they need to be in the bill. Um, but uh, as I said, what I meant to say earlier, these are intended to be positive um, and, and be also something that the community supports, and so they'll be front-loaded. But in the event where there is, is a dispute and triggers are met, then we would expect notification to, to central government. Uh, I think that uh, Mr McNearney has covered that um, in some depth, Convener. Anything to add, Mr Simpson? Uh, just in the, in the bill, there's no, in, in the section that mentions this, there's no mention of disputes. It's just a, a, a blanket power. That's, that's, that's just a fact. Is that, is, that, is that something the government may have to think, or think about and consider to, to restrict or put criteria around that power? Convener, as I said in my earlier answer, um, maybe two answers ago, um, you know, we will set out and consult on the procedures around about this. Um, you know, um, these things will be open uh, to scrutiny as they always are. Okay. Thank you. I think we, we, we need to move on now. Uh, I'll take you later for that line of questioning, Mr. Mr. White. I can see you trying to catch my eye there. I think we'll move on, move on to an area that I know Ms. Goldruth and Mr. Stewart's getting interested in. So can I take Jenny Goldruth first, please? Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning to the Minister and the panel. Um, I want to, to look in specific detail at the legislation as it currently stands with regard to local place plans. Now, obviously, uh, the legislation in its current form says that we need to have regard to the local place plan, uh, and therefore it is the case at the current time that a local place plan could be created by a community and then the community's needs could be completely ignored. And this was highlighted, actually, in a previous uh, evidence session. Dr Andy Inch said... Uh, there's a risk of the weak status for local place plans and decision making is that communities and others can invest hundreds of hours and hundreds, a huge amounts of voluntary time and effort into producing one, only to find that subsequent uh, decisions broadly are, have been disregarded, uh, have broadly disregarded them rather. So I just wonder then, Minister, do we need to revisit the wording of the legislation and consider again about perhaps putting this on some sort of statutory footing so that communities are listened to in the planning process? Um, <coughs> Excuse me, Convener. Um, we want planning authorities to consider seriously uh, the, pa the plans that local, uh, local communities uh, have put forward um, for their places. Um, but uh, they will not be bound to adopt them um, in full. Uh, planning has to uh, deal with the connections of places at all scales, so there has to be consideration um, right a, a, across uh, the board. And of course, there also has to be account taken um, of the national planning framework. Um, as I say, planning authorities have to consider um, the whole area um, that they represent, uh, how uh, they meet their statutory duties uh, on issues such as uh, equalities and climate change, uh, which local place plans may not may not cover. Um, I've listened very carefully, um, convener, to the arguments that have been made uh, on this point um, around about um, wording. Um, uh, and uh, I, 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 we have, at the moment, have regard. Um, I've listened carefully, um, and I think uh, that we should require planning authorities to take account uh, of local place plans and pre preparing their local development plans. Uh, convener, that would place them uh, on the same level um, as the national planning framework uh, and local outcome improvement plans, uh, where that phraseology um, take account um, is there. I see a lot of fellow members uh, disagreeing here, so I, I want to follow up that, that line of questioning then. Um, <laughs> In terms of taking account, again, I don't assume that puts a statutory obligation on them to actually listen to these plans, does it? 
Uh, they have to. I think the fe- it, w- it was a bemused look rather than a disagree a look of disagreement from, from committee members. The minister, if you can enlighten us, that would be helpful. Um, c- convener, um, I-, I think you know we have a situation where I want to ensure that communities um, have their say in all of this, but there are other factors which come into play. Um, There are factors which the local development plan needs to take account of as well. Um, And, you know, there are things uh, which are required um, uh, in terms of policy around about that local development plan and delivering for an area as a whole and not necessarily just that community. So there has to be, there has to be um, at some points um, the ability um, for a local authority um, to place either its um, necessary policy objectives um, or national planning framework objectives into account. Um, As members are are well aware, um, the local uh, development plan has to go through um, some substantial scrutiny uh, before being adopted, and that includes um, things like strategic and environmental assessment uh, and independent examination as well as public consultation. Um, if local place plans uh, were to be automatically adopted, um, they would also um, need um, similar um, scrutiny. Um, and we want to reduce bureaucracy, as folk are well aware, uh, but we want to make it easy for communities to put forward Um, their proposals and their ambitions um, for their places. Um, Our approach here um, therefore allows the scrutiny um, uh, to be undertaken when a planning authority prepares or reviews um, its local development plan, um, taking account of local place plans for the area rather than placing the burden on the community. Convener, one of the things which I've said um, elsewhere um, around about community planning in its very early stages, um, communities themselves went in, um, in the first uh, one that I was ever involved in, and placed on a map of that area um, stickers of what they wanted to see um, in that particular area. Um, and we ended up in a situation in that uh, in that particular exercise uh, where folk wanted three swimming pools within four streets. Um, there were no parameters set around about this. There was no communication about this um, at all. And I think um, people exercise um, good judgment when they know that there are certain things that have to take place um, in a particular area. Um, And I think if we get to that level of communication, um, then people (coughs) will uh, formulate their place plans, taking account of what is necessary um, for that particular place. Uh, Again, removing um, unnecessary conflict. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that is the place uh, where I would like to to see us being. Um, As a supplementary to that, um, many of the organisations we've taken evidence from have highlighted um, the capacity issues around about developing those local place plans. Sure. So (coughs) many organisations we've taken evidence from have suggested there should be a cost associated with it and that government should support that financially. Um, But my my concern is that actually poorer communities are going to be disadvantaged by this local place plan. And if there isn't already an active community council, for example, there isn't an obvious body to develop it. And there might not be capacity there because the community in the past may not have ever had the opportunity to feed into the planning process. So I wonder, therefore, if you could comment on, on both of those issues. Um, can, I, can I start with some of the costs that, yeah. have, um, that have been put forward by, um, by some folk who have given evidence here um, and to other committees of the parliament? And uh, one of the, the costs that um, has been put forward is... Um, uh, the cost of about £13,000 for each local yeah. place plan. Um, that £13,000 would be um, the total cost if a, a community itself um, had to pay for every single thing um, in terms of 
a, a charrette type circumstance. Mm. And I don't think that that is um, entirely necessary. And I said that um, to um, the Finance Committee when I appeared in front of them uh, a few weeks ago, convener. Um, we already have uh, a number um, of uh, places um, around the country um, who have formulated um, their own place plans um, with uh, no uh, real uh, resource input uh, from anywhere else. Um, and in some cases, um, I, I've heard said that um, folk didn't want the resource input because they thought that that may be mean interference from elsewhere. So I, I, I've talked um, in the chamber previously about uh, Linlithgow and its uh, local place plan, uh, where, which they did on their own. Um, the convener of the Finance Committee was talking uh, about um, areas in, in his Stirling constituency uh, where folk have done their own uh, local uh, place plans. The financial memorandum in this convener, which I went in, in some depth, over in some depth in the Finance Committee, estimates um, for five to six local place plans um, uh, over a three-year period in a, a medium-sized authority. Um, the total estimate is around about 92 per year um, in, uh, the, um, in that financial memora memorandum. Um, I don't want um, local place plans uh, to be um, too onerous um, or to even require um, necessarily a significant uh, amount of planning expertise. Uh, we already have tools and templates which will which help uh, communities understand uh, and formulate um, uh, what they think is required in their place. Um, and you know, I've talked at this committee previously um, about the use of the place standard, and I think that um, that is um, that is uh, one of the ways forward. In terms of Mr. Goldruth's point around about. Um, uh, more disadvantaged communities. Um, I said at the Finance Committee that I would have an expectation um, that local authorities um, would uh, prioritise and use resource to support communities, uh, de more deprived communities, who want to formulate um, local place plans uh, with the help um, that they actually need. Um, and I would hope um, that the engagement um, uh, would, uh, uh, in, in terms of um, <coughs> formulating local development <coughs> plans, uh, would look uh, at being completely and utterly inclusive and ensuring um, that those communities that are more disadvantaged uh, get the help and support. Finally, convener, again um, at the Finance Committee, I pointed out um, that there are also um, government funds uh, available um, in terms of um, uh, this area of work. Um, the £20 million pound in Powering Community Funds uh, invests in <coughs> communities so that they can develop the resource and resilience um, uh, to decide their own priorities and needs. And I would imagine that there will be applications into that fund uh, from that. And of course, um, the government has invested over the last number of years uh, in terms of allowing uh, communities uh, to hold their own charrette. So there are, are these opportunities, but I share, uh, certainly share Ms Gowrie's uh, desire uh, to ensure uh, that some of the poorer communities are not disadvantaged in all of this, and that I would ex expect local authorities to prioritise help um, to them in the first instance. Just as a, a final uh, point on that, I suppose it's more of a point than a question. You might want to comment on this. Um, the committee recently has taken an, a, a lot of evidence on the city deals and produced a report, and we'll be having a debate next week. And we have heard evidence previously at this committee with regard to the disconnect between the city deals aspiration and the planning process, the city deals which were meant to drive inclusive growth. And I thought it was interesting, Minister, when you, you alluded to local authorities' uh, actions and that you would hope they would listen to the aspirations of communities. In my experience, I have to say that Fife Council didn't listen to the aspirations of some of the poorest communities in Scotland that, that I represent. And because it wasn't, I suppose, compelled 
you know, Fife Council weren't, they weren't required to evidence how they had carried out community engagement. It was just hoped that they would. They just didn't do it. And there is a, a concern, I suppose, for uh, myself, certainly, that local authorities, if they're not actually compelled to do something, just won't do it. And uh, we'll, we'll go forward with their own pet projects, as was the case, certainly, within the city deals, in my experience, whereby the city of Edinburgh benefited hugely from that funding, and actually Fife really didn't. Um, convener, I have read the committee's um, City Deal report, but that was uh, a number of weeks ago, and uh, I cannot remember all of the detail of your recommendations uh, off the top of my head. Um, the City Deal scenario, um, uh, of course, um, uh, falls within uh, Mr. Brown's uh, yeah. domain, um, and I think um, uh, I don't want to put words in. Uh, Mr. Brown or anybody else's uh, his mouth, but um, I think that there have been some frustrations at points in terms of the negotiating around about uh, about these, and sometimes the quickness um, that things are, are mm -hmm. done without opportunity. Um, um, certainly, I will convey um, uh, Ms. Gorus's uh, remarks to um, Mr. Brown around about this. Where there is the opportunity for um, consultation, I would always want there to be um, that consultation. Um, and I know that um, uh, Mr Brown and others will look very carefully um, at the scrutiny um, that the committee uh, has had on city deals and will look carefully um, at your recommendations. But I will certainly uh, pass on Ms Gorey's uh, remarks to Mr Brown, who's probably already heard them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I can confirm he almost certainly has yes. already heard them, Minister, <coughs> um, and hopefully he'll get, give regard and take account of them. Uh, well, uh, you finished that line of questioning, yes, Ms. Gorus? <coughs> just, just very patient, because your colleague Graham Simpson has got a very specific supplementary on this. If others have got supplementaries on this, I'd ask them to hold them back until Mr. Mr Stewart's exhausted his line of questioning, but just briefly, Mr Simpson. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to allow Alexander Stewart in if it's on local. <coughs> you can come back in. It's yeah, up to you, convener. Well, it's a very specific point. So it might be quite right. good if you raised it now, okay. it's still fresh. Well, you, 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 you mentioned uh, Lynn Lithgow. Um, now, a couple of members of the committee, myself included, uh, visited Lynn Lithgow and spoke to the people who'd been involved in uh, preparing that local place plan. Um, and uh, I have to say, uh, they were less than impressed with with, with the process. Um, they produced, a, well, they put an awful lot of work into it. Sure. Um, pr produced um, quite a very impressive document. Um, and then West Lothian Council decided not to adopt it. And I think this is the point that, that Jenny Gilruth uh, was making in her line of questioning, that if councils either uh, have, uh, only have to have regard to or take account of whatever form of words you want to use, that same outcome can come about. So, you know, do you not think uh, in the bill, the bill needs to be a bit tougher you know, to actually make councils do, do something? Um, convener, um, the take account aspect, um, as I said, would create um, equality with other aspects um, of planning. I'm going to take Mr McLeod in on, uh, on the use of the, the terminology take account and then I'll answer um, the specific points that Mr Simpson has raised. Mr McLeod. Um, <coughs> well, the distinction between take account of it and have regard to it, I don't think I'm going to spend much time discussing that. I think the important thing is that the, uh, the words to take account of on the face of the bill, this is the legislative requirement, will be the same if the amendment were made. Um, for local place plans, as it would be for the national planning framework, and for uh, local outcome improvements plans, they'd be treated the same way in terms of the legislation. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that you'd want to put one higher than the other. So in terms of uh, this requirement on local authorities when preparing local development plans to take account of various matters, it would be the same for the national planning framework as it would be for local development plans in terms of the legislation. Okay, um, okay. Minister. Uh, if I can come back to um, some of the, the, the 
more specific points that Mr Simpson uh, has made. I've not had the opportunity um, to go to Linlithgow or to speak to the, the good folk that um, uh, put together the plan. Um, I was sent, um, as folk are aware, an overview uh, of their document, and I have to say that I was very impressed um, with uh, what the community has achieved there. Um, of course, um, that has been done uh, under the current situation. Um, the provision in the bill uh, will mean that communities uh, like Linlithgow uh, have a, a clearer uh, role uh, in the process uh, and uh, planning authorities uh, will be better equipped uh, to take uh, account uh, of uh, the engagement that there is there. Um, obviously, um, convener, um, I want to see um, uh, good uh, practice taking hold um, uh, uh, across um, uh, authorities, and I want to see, as uh, in other spheres of business, uh, of business, uh, uh, a community planning level, um, uh, local authorities taking account um, of uh, what folks have to say. Um, I think. Convener, um, that in some regards, um, you know, uh, terminology um, in, in legislation um, can often be difficult. But as has been pointed out by Mr McLeod, the terminology of take account is no different uh, to what we have in terms of the legislation um, uh, in the national planning framework um, and in local outcome uh, improvement plans. Yeah, I think... I'm going to leave it at that point, Mr Simpson, but can I also thank you for putting on record um, the concerns from Linlithgow, because this committee has to mirror the, the evidence and concerns we hear in communities. We've done a lot of outreach work in relation to this, so thank you very much for, for doing that. A few supplementaries on this, potentially, but Mr Stewart, do you want to explore a, a line of inquiry first? Thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, you, you, you touched on at the beginning about improving the experience uh, and ensuring that communities uh, could have their say. Uh, and local place plans may well be a vehicle to achieving that process. Uh, but, but can I ask about why you've chosen to go down that route when, in some cases, if you'd looked at the improving the engagement at the drafting of the local development plan, that could have been achieved? Um, convener, I want um, uh, folk to be involved um, in planning much more um, than they cur currently are. Um, it kind of frustrates me um, that um, a huge amount of the engagement that takes place um, is at the end of uh, a process, and that is normally objection um, to uh, something coming forward. I want folk um, to, at an early course, uh, play a part in shaping um, their communities. Um, and in particular, I want young folk um, to play a role in shaping their futures because they um, are the folk who are least involved at this moment in the planning system. Uh, and they are the folks who are going to be most effective, affected by decisions um, that we are taking um, in the here and now. Um, we are not introducing um, local place plans um, alone. I want to see further engagement uh, during the drafting of local development plans too. Um, so we want to do both. Uh, and as part of the um, wider planning review, um, we'll bring forward uh, proposals to ensure uh, that planning authorities consult more widely uh, on their development plans, um, including um, with children and young people. I've been um, mightily impressed by um, a pilot that has been taking place at Gala Shields Academy. Um, the government has put some resource in uh, to allow PASS to carry out um, a, a pilot there using the play standard, which I mentioned um, previously. Now, to begin with, they were using um, the place standard um, in, uh, uh, in paper form. But an app has been developed, which, of course, um, has meant even uh, more excitement uh, about um, uh, uh, this project. Um, and, you know, it would be fair to say, I think, 
um, that how the young folk of Galashios envisage their place is much different okay. from those folks who have currently uh, been engaged in the planning process um, because they see things much, much differently. Um, and participation, of course, is one um, of the six key themes uh, in the Year of Young People. Um, but I want this to go beyond this year. I want this to be uh, permanent. Um, so beyond um, the, the, um, uh, that pilot at Gala Shields, um, I've got um, a, a, a group, um, a, a digital task force looking at planning as a whole mm -hmm. um, and how we can use new technologies um, to simplify the current system, but also to get more folk engaged. Because I think that um, it is key um, that we get much more people in, uh, engaged uh, in uh, the situation. Um, but um, I would say that um, this is not just about local place plans. This is also about improving communication and getting more engagement um, in local development plans. So it's not one or the other. It's all. And I, and I think that having that engagement uh, and that aspiration and uh, to, to achieve that uh, and that ambition uh, to have young people involved, I think, are, are all good and well, Minister, and, and we would all probably want to see that. But it's making that happen. It's trying to ensure that that does take place. Uh, that's the big issue here uh, as to how you manage that. And, and in communities where they do have uh, an engagement and they do have a structure, that could be achieved and that could be expanded. Uh, but it's ensuring that communities that do not have that structure are not disadvantaged yeah. in this whole process is the most important. Or we end up having a, a slightly two-tier system uh, where communities that do have that process uh, can engage and do engage, uh, and, and others do not. Um, I agree completely and utterly with Mr Stewart in terms of the, uh, engagement there. Um, I want to see priority um, in terms of resource given to communities uh, that may struggle uh, to become uh, engaged. Um, and I want uh, to ensure um, that plan planning authorities themselves, when it comes to um, the formulation um, of uh, development plans, I want to see them widen mm -hmm. um, the communication um, that currently goes on. Um, and I do, um, without doubt, uh, want to see more f young folk uh, involved in the system. I think that, convener, um, it is, planning itself has been described uh, by some folk to me as being rather dry. Um, I want to make it a bit exciting. Um, and I think with, um, with technology, um, we can do that. That's why, you know, I, I, all of this um, review um, is not just about this bill. We are on a journey here um, uh, in, in terms of the results of the independent review, now the planning review, the planning bill, MPF Scottish planning policy, but we need to continue uh, uh, on that journey to make sure uh, that we get more folk involved. Um, convener, if you excuse this expe expression, um, rather than uh, being uh, seen as, uh, as being uh, uh, dry, I want planning to be seen by folk as being a wee bit sexy and something that they want to get involved in. Well, that might be a very good time to, to in, interject, in, in, interject there, Minister. I, I'm just conscious, a um, very lengthy re reply that you've given there, and we're grateful to that, but we're hoping to... I mean, we've scheduled two hours, 45 minutes, which is a huge amount of time to spend with yourselves. That must be exciting, as, we, as, as I mentioned. I, ho I hope you're giving me a half-time break, convener. Well, well, <laughs> well, we can do that. In fact, I, I could be up for, for taking a, a brief break at 11am, 11, 11 if that, if that I, would be I, welcome. I'd be grateful for, for that. For five minutes. But an appeal <coughs> to MSPs, and I'm about to ask a question as well, and to yourself, Minister, about a bit more focus and brevity and questions and answers, and we'll get there, and we'll get the comfort break, and we'll have it done and dusted by 12 p.m. So that's an appeal to to everyone. Alexander Stewart, do you want to follow up on any of that? I, I, convener, I think the, the minister has identified where, where we all want to try and achieve, uh, and and that that's very much the the case. Uh, uh, and the bill itself will enable that to happen if it's resourced and if uh, councils are resourced uh, and uh, communities are resourced. But if they're not resourced, then it will fail. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, my question would be, how, how are we going to bridge that gap? 
Um, uh, convener, in the financial memorandum, um, it shows that the freeing up uh, of folk from doing a huge amount of uh, the uh, bureaucratic stuff uh, saves uh, a fair uh, amount of money. Um, I don't have a number off my, the top of my head, it'll come to me. Um, but I would expect um, local authorities um, to use um, that freed up resource um, to deal with the changes that we are bringing forward um, and investing um, in helping uh, communities uh, have their say, uh, whether that be through local place plans or whether that be through um, greater engagement. There is a huge opportunity uh, there uh, to be able to do that. Um, in terms of um, resourcing itself, um, uh, convener, uh, and I recognise that um, you um, and, uh, and others uh, committees have heard a fair amount of resourcing about resourcing. Um, one of the things which uh, we have seen over the past few weeks is in some local authorities, um, in their budgets, uh, they have put in uh, additional resource for planning. And I'm pleased to see that. I think it's Craig from RTPI uh, said that currently 0.44% of uh, local authority budgets go to planning, and their expectation is that to drop to 0.4%. I hope that some of the change that we're seeing will actually see um, uh, uh, resources increase. Convener, I've also um, said previously um, that um, in, in terms of um, uh, resourcing itself, uh, I would like planning a, 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 a point to uh, become uh, cost neutral, mm. so that the fees that are coming in cover the costs of the service completely and utterly. Um, but I've also said that I'm not willing to increase planning fees again until we see um, increased uh, performance. And uh, in a number of authorities, we are beginning to see um, that increased performance. What I will not do um, is uh, I don't really want to dictate uh, to local authorities um, how um, they should spend um, uh, their their money. But you can be assured that I will be keeping a very close eye in terms of, of uh, resourcing um, over the piece and performance over the piece um, so that we can get to that point maybe in the future where we have a, a, a service that pays for itself. Mr Thank Stewart. You. Okay. Now, I'm going to follow up on some of that myself, but I'll note that I've got Jenny Gould and Monica Lennon for supplementaries in, in relation to this as well. Um, now, resources will, will, <coughs> will, will be an issue. One, one additional area of complexity with local place plans, of course, is that if it has to fit in, if it has to complement or dovetail with local development plans, because I fully accept that you know, if, if, if the local place plan goes off in one direction and the local development plan goes in another direction, then how can they mesh together and how can one be adopted by the other? So there has to be a lot more closer articulation between the local place plan and the local development plan. I'm not sure how that happens, but it's got to take account of the national planning framework as well. So there's a degree of meaningful expertise required to develop local place plans that will have added weight and value to influencing local development plans. That costs money. Uh, if an area doesn't have an active community development trust or it's not a particularly affluent area, the skill set that exists may not be there for that or the resources. So any reflections in relation to how you might target resources going forward, not just local authorities, but also government might target resources going forward would be helpful. Um, Convener, um, I don't have the financial memorandum in front of me at this moment and off the top of my head, I kind of remember some of the numbers. So I will write to you. Um, I've already given uh, evidence, as you're well aware, to the Finance Committee around about um, uh, resources uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the um, figures. Um, but if you don't quote me, I think if uh, uh, I think we, we have got uh, a Minister, can, can, can I just for your own safety here warn uh, you that this is a live session? The, uh, of, uh, uh, if you don't if you don't hold me to this, there are a number of millions. Um, I, I'm not being specific here, which um, the financial memorandum sees um, uh, as coming into play uh, with the changes to the local development plan system, um, which will free up um, that resource. Now, I would um, expect local authorities um, to look at 
uh, using that additional resource that they will have at their disposal uh, to investing into um, local uh, place planning um, and into ensuring that communication um, of uh, local development planning um, is right. Obviously, convener, um, I um, do not want to um, uh, dictate to local authorities around about this, but I think that this gives them a huge amount of opportunity um, in ensuring that that freed up resource uh, goes into um, uh, ensuring that they get this area's um, of business absolutely um, right. Um, in addition um, uh, to that, um, convener, um, you know, uh, the bill, um, after the bill itself, we'll consult again um, on uh, the fee structure uh, and enhanced fees, including discretionary charging. Um, to ensure that the uh, the development coming forward, uh, they reflect the development coming forward, uh, and will undertake um, a full impact assessment uh, on the implication of the changes um, uh, for users of the system. Okay. Um, Minister, I apologise for not bringing the financial memorandum with me, convener. I think you've answered a really good question, but it wasn't specifically the one I asked. Um, the, the, the point I'm trying to make, Minister, is is that I think I think you're on, I hope you're appreciating that there could be a, an intense resource required to be targeted to certain parts of a local authority area in certain parts of the country. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that's maybe the sense. And your reply was in relation to what local authorities could do from any efficiencies they make to target some of that money yep. in their own area. But you also mentioned national funds that exist that could, in theory, yep. be used. I suppose my contention might be that separate from existing national funds and separate from what local authorities might do, that some form of a pilot, pilot fund May, may, may be really beneficial to target some of this work proactively in some of our deprived communities across Scotland. I'm decoupling that specifically from the financial memorandum uh, in relation to make the bill work, but to bring to life this act as and when it is passed, that community capacity building and a standalone fund, I think, would be very welcome. Don't, uh, I know you don't hold the purse strings, Minister, but is that something you'd give consideration to? Um, what I would consider, um, convener, is targeting the funds that um, uh, Planning and Architecture Division uh, have at this moment uh, into, uh, into certain areas to see what the benefits of that are. Um, I am certainly, um, convener, not um, uh, promising any additional funding. Um, that would be going against what is uh, in the uh, financial memorandum. Um, and uh, of course, um, you know, you wouldn't expect uh, <clears throat> nothing less. And I think that Mr. Mackay uh, would be extremely unhappy right. with me if I were to uh, promise uh, additional monies, which I don't have at my disposal to doing this. But what I, I, I will do, convener, uh, is consider targeting um, the uh, funds that we, can, we currently have uh, into ensuring um, that c community capacity and resilience um, uh, is there uh, in certain places. But again, uh, I would reiterate the point that my expectation uh, would be that local authorities themselves uh, would use the freed up resource uh, to getting this absolutely right in their areas. Um, and as I said in my response to uh, Ms Gilruth, uh, my expectation that they would see um, more dis disadvantaged right. communities right. as being the priority. Okay, and you can give us more information on that. <coughs> Just a, a bit of a couple of things and then to, to our further supplementary. So, uh, Mr. Shoup was also talking about development plans. It wasn't just local place plans that mm -hmm. we were referring to. Um, and we're talking about that early community engagement, uh, not as a one-off, but as a recurring exercise in community engagement, whether there's a local place plan or not. But there's not a duty within the bill uh, for stakeholder and community engagement in the development of the evidence report within uh, development plans or during the gate check exercise. Are they missed opportunities that government might want to reconsider in relation to that community engagement at those stages? Uh, convener, our intention is that uh, communities should be closely engaged uh, in the preparation of the evidence report uh, and that the gate check should examine how the engagement has uh, taken place and the areas of agreement or dispute uh, with different stakeholders. 
Um, there are powers for uh, ministers to prescribe matters uh, to be included in the evidence report uh, and the procedures and matters to be assessed in the gate check. Uh, that's section 16A inserted by <coughs> excuse me, section 3.4 uh, of the bill. Uh, we intend to include the duties for stakeholder uh, and community engagement through uh, that secondary legislation. Excuse me. Uh, how, however, I understand um, uh, the concerns of the committee uh, that our intentions for greater community engagement in development planning are not visible uh, on the face of the bill. Uh, there are a number of ways that that might be strengthened. Uh, and I'll consider uh, <coughs> excuse me, what amendments uh, we might bring forward uh, in that respect at stage two of the bill. I think, I think that, would be, that, that would be very welcome. Uh, I think we'll give some other members opportunity to find some supplementaries in relation to this. I'll take Jenny over and then Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Uh, just a brief supplementary. Um, Minister, you, you spoke about um, planning becoming exciting. I, I won't use the other word that you use, mm -hmm. but in your letter to the committee, you say it's not always the case that community groups represent the views of their community as a whole. And I suppose going back to my line of questioning previously with regard to local place plans, if you think about community councils' makeup, they're often people of a certain demographic, uh, perhaps per people of a certain gender as well. So there, there might be a disconnect there in terms of who those organisations are actually representing. And I heard you speak about Gala Shields Academy. Now, on Friday, my colleague Andy Whiteman and I met with people from Gala Shields Academy. They're a fantastic group of young people and they're completely engaged in the process in their area. But when you start going through the specifics of the legislation with them, they look to us with blank faces, as you might you know, expect members of the public to. But when you actually said to them, what's your school like? What would a new school look like to you? They suddenly came alive and they started talking about it. So I think there is an opportunity here to get the voices of young people into the planning bill. Now, when we were talking to them about um, the legislation in its current form as to whether or not it listened to communities, they thought there should be uh, some sort of statutory requirement for young people to be spoken to and, and the community. Now, this is obviously an opportunity for the government. You, the young people, uh, should it not be an opportunity for the government to signal its intent about how important young people's voices are and actually mandate councils to listen to the views of young people in any planning system so that, for example, when they're designing schools, they have to listen to the people who populate our schools, the pupils and the young people. Um, I'm glad that uh, Ms Gilruth and uh, Mr Whiteman were excited by the opportunity to meet the folk from Gala Shields and to hear their views, um, because they are somewhat different from the views that many of us hear um, on a, a regular basis. Um, I want everyone to become involved in the planning system. And I don't know if um, mandating particular groups um, is necessarily the right way forward because then we would have to go through an entire gamut and it may well be um, you know um, that that adds to adds to, to, to bureaucracies um, certainly the regulations um, for um, local development plans will set out engagement requirements um, and I want to be pretty strong um, on those requirements. Um, I will reflect um, on what um, uh, Ms Gilruth has said about mandation, um, but, you know, um, I, 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 I think, you know, we have to be careful uh, about that. But I will certainly, I'll reflect on what you've said. But what you can be very, very assured of is that I want young people to be involved in this system. And beyond that, I want many, many, many more people who are currently disengaged from the system to become uh, involved. I think if we get that, convener, I think we will have much, much less conflict yeah, within I suppose, the system. I suppose my point is, um, if we get that generational change, um, people are far less likely to think that planning is something that's done to them, yes. uh, as opposed to it being something they are part of, and actually it's a, more of a bottom-up approach. And that's certainly the views we were getting from Gala Shields Academy, and it would be great if other schools and other young people felt they had the capacity to engage in the system, or if the system could adapt to actually engage with a wider audience of people, as opposed to a select few who sit on community councils, yeah. for example. Um, 
it, it's that wider audience um, convener is not just necessarily through schools yeah. or or um, any other formal process. Um, I think um, in, in order to get the complete and utter uh, buy-in of folk, we need to change the way we do things. Yeah. And I, I, th I think that technology uh, gives us um, that ability. Um, it is quite something uh, where you're able to see a 3D visualisation um, of a place from an iPad as you walk around, mm -hmm. a blank space seeing what is proposed in an area. Those kind of things, um, not just in a building scale, but on a place scale, um, if we can do that, we'll, I think, ensure um, that we be, bring new folk in, into, into planning and becoming involved uh, in, in the system itself. That is the area that really, really excites me. And I think that, you know, um, I will certainly be doing all that I can and it's not just because it's the year of young people, okay. all that I can to make sure that young people are involved in this system, because I, I think I'm, it's vital. I'm, I'm trying really hard not to cut you off. Minister, I know, I know, sorry, moved, sorry. As we move to the last hour, hour and a half, I, I, I'm from being a kind of laid back chair and letting you just expand your answers, you're going to find me having to start to cut you off. So I'm just kind of pre-warning that, that, that just now, Monica, Monica Lennon. OK, well, in terms of young people and actually being able to effect change through the bill, has the government given consideration to giving young people statutory rights? Now, that could be in terms of a school community being able to bring forward a local place plan. That could be in terms of pre-application pre consultation that members of the Scottish Youth Parliament, for example, could be uh, a, a consultee, could have formal rights uh, in the way that community councils do. Um, that would be a way to embed rights for young people as key stakeholders rather than just uh, reminding people they have the opportunity to take part and encouraging local authorities and, and ministers and others to, to take them into account. Can we not just embed rights into the bill? Um, convener, um, uh, I think that in some regards, uh, the move that we are making uh, in terms of local place plans uh, should ensure that many folk, uh, more folk, are involved um, in uh, the uh, formulation uh, of local place plans and getting involved in planning as a whole. Um, I, um, I, I think that in some regards, um, what Ms Lennon is uh, proposing um, is a situation uh, where, you know, um, I've got absolutely no problem with schools or, or, or young folk or anyone else becoming involved, as I've just probably got overexcited in answering Ms, yeah. Ms Galruth. I want to see that to happen. But I, mean, uh, but I don't think that minister. that is necessary uh, on the face of the bill. Okay, well, I wasn't uh, asking um, about involvement. I was asking about rights to be consulted um, and rights to bring forward a local place plan. Is that something that you're willing to consider at this I, stage? I, I, I would expect um, local authorities, as they do with almost every other consultation that they do, to, to involve as many people uh, as possible um, in uh, that consultation, in that community uh, uh, engagement. Um, Local place plans, I think, will work best um, when entire, the entire community um, becomes involved. Um, I want that to happen, uh, but prescribing um, different groups um, on the face of the bill is not necessarily something that I would agree with, Convener. OK, um, we're now going to move on to another line of questioning, and then we are going to a comfort break um, at that point. Uh, so, Mr Whiteman, could you take the next line of questioning forward? Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I want to, to explore national, the National Planning Framework and Strategic Development <coughs> Plans. Uh, before I do so, though, I've got a brief question going back to the questions about sustainable, uh, sorry, simplified development zones. Um, section 7 of the new Schedule 5A um, uh, says that a request is valid if the requirements prescribed in regulations um, have been met. These regulations don't make any reference to the kind of person who could make a request for a simplified development zone. Um, the request, as it stands at the moment, appears to be able to arise from anybody. Uh, my, my, my sister lives in Switzerland. Could she 
make a valid request for a simplified development zone? Uh, Mr White, my sister's going to be on the Christmas card list soon. She's made a few appearances <laughs> at committee. Minister, could you address that question? Um, I, I, I don't know if I'll be on our Christmas card list or whether she'll be in mine. I'll bring in Mr McNerney first, convener. Mr McNerney. <coughs> so there's, there's not a restriction on the basis that proposals might emerge from a private landowner, for example. Um, so you're correct on, on, in the bill that there, there isn't that restriction. And we would, we would need to rely on regulations to define in more detail um, if there were specific um, connections with a locality um, or any other restrictions. But so I suppose that's, that's my question, because uh, 7.3 says regulations may in particular include requirements as to how a request may be made and steps that must take, be taken before a request may be made. Can I take it then that when it says may in particular include, that that does not preclude some elements and regulations that would say something about who can um, make a request? I would say yes, but we, we have our lawyer with us. So, Norman, if you'd like to just well, take I mean, that question. I'm not sure the idea of individuals from Switzerland making uh, requests was considered when we did this, but um, the basic thrust of this is that there's no limitation set out and the, the filter ultimately is the quality of the plan that comes forward and it goes through the request is made for the plan and it goes to the local uh, planning authority and they will consider the merits of that proposal rather than the identity of the person who's made it. Okay, per se. Can I, that's helpful. Can, okay. can I, can I, I apologise, I don't want to explore that further but can I, can I urge just for, for time constraints that Minister, it would be helpful if you could write to the committee with greater clarity over the intent within the bill and subsequent regulations in relation to who would or should or could or may be precluded from bringing forward a simplified development zone or else we're going to reopen up this entire line of questioning again and we are moving on to a new area minister uh, we'll certainly write uh, to the committee around about that I, I don't know if mr whiteman wants a copy for his sister <laughs> That, Sorry that, 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 that would be helpful. I'm just concerned that the regulations don't, make, uh, don't appear to include provision for that and the system could get clogged up with all sorts no, of I'm not, uh, not requests. your point, Mr Whiteman, it's stuck in a time constraint. Absolutely. No, no, I'm very, very conscious of that, convener. Thanks for that indeed. Um, right, on the national planning framework, um, the bill makes important and, and significant uh, provisions um, and changes to, to the national planning framework and how it's uh, handled, how it's regarded. It is, for example, to be combined with the Scottish planning policy and importantly, it's to become part of the development plan. And I would strike, like to reflect on earlier comments where um, the idea that uh, local place plans, uh, that the local authorities would take account of local place plans, would put local place plans on the same footing as the taking account of the national planning framework. That, of course, literally is correct but it forgets the fact, of course, the bill proposes that the national planning framework be become part of the development plan. So it's got a, a massively enhanced status compared with anything else. I'm just wondering why you felt that it was necessary to make the national planning framework, which historically is a kind of light touch, spatial expression of ministers' um, uh, 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 policies, why it's necessary to make it part of the statutory development plan? Um, Convener, the independent panel uh, made the case uh, for this, uh, and many stakeholders, um, of course, have called for an enhanced role for the national planning framework. Uh, incorporating uh, the Scottish planning policy into the national planning framework is a big opportunity to uh, streamline local development plans across so, so Scotland. If I can, if I can just under, I'm, I'm not particularly concerned about merging planning policy and the okay. national planning framework. I'm asking about why does it need to be part of the development plan? Um, well, one of the things is that um, it will, uh, there will be no need uh, to repeat um, uh, policies in 34 different local development plans, um, unless, of course, um, there is a need to tailor them to local circumstances. Um, we also uh, intend to use uh, the MPF to provide greater clarity um, and requirements for housing lands uh, to reduce some of the conflict um, that exists in the system at, at this moment as well. Um, and uh, development plan status um, uh, will help in that regard. Um, instead of current situations, 
um, local development plans uh, themselves can focus on achieving outcomes, uh, places and where future development should actually happen. Um, uh, we believe um, uh, that they're, by reducing duplication, uh, this could significantly uh, reduce the amount of time that people and organisations have to spend uh, uh, on contributing to, to development plans. Mr Whiteman? So, so just, just to explore that a little bit further, um, the significant difference is between the, state, the situation we have at the moment under the 2006 Act, which is, recall, the uh, planning authorities must have regard or take account, I can't remember, which is of the national planning framework. Which uh, Commissioner, I'll take in uh, Mr McNearney first, please. If you could clarify. Um, thank you. Um, just briefly, currently the, the development plan is the strategic development plan and the local development plan in that combination. Um, the bill clearly proposes that we no longer prepare the strategic development plan. So um, a key r reason why the national planning framework should become part of the development plan is to take account of that strategic element um, which currently exists, albeit only around the four largest cities, um, so that we, we have that conjoined development plan. It's different, but it allows there to be a strategic um, overview, part of the development plan over the whole country. That's, that's a key reason. That, that's helpful. Um, of course, that, I'll come on to the strategic development plan because that presupposes that we do get yes. rid of them, that it becomes part of the uh, development plan. On the basis that it does become part of the development plan, can I ask a few questions about how the national planning framework is agreed? So at the moment, uh, ministers uh, publish um, the plan and it's laid before Parliament and this committee and other committees have a look at it. Indeed, I think, if I, if I remember correctly, that the minister himself was a convener of the committee that perhaps scrutinised the last one in 2014, uh, or, or maybe not. Uh, that went to a debate of Parliament, I think, in March 2014, and Parliament passed a motion um, stating that the reports of the committees were Parliament's response to the government on its proposed national planning uh, framework. Um, so Parliament doesn't approve the national planning framework, and yet it is becoming part of the development plan for all 34 planning authorities in Scotland. Is there a case for improving the scrutiny and the sign-off and the approval of the National Planning Framework in Parliament to enhance its democratic standing. Uh, convener, um, as uh, Mr Whiteman points out, Parliament uh, was uh, involved, fully involved, um, in uh, National Planning Framework 3. Uh, the lead committee took evidence from the minister at an early stage and during the scrutiny, uh, four committees uh, heard evidence and produced reports on MPF3. Um, we are at an early stage in designing the process um, for National Planning Framework 4, uh, but are taking into account recommendations uh, made by Parliament when they considered MPF3. Uh, for example, convener, the report on MPF3 asked that we build in um, early debate by Parliament on the national developments, uh, and I think that that would be extremely helpful. Uh, as other witnesses have said to uh, the committee, um, there's a good track record of taking uh, into account the views uh, of Parliament in finalising um, the national planning framework. Um, and I, you can be assured, um, convener, that I'll consider um, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee's recommendations on uh, amendments uh, of National Planning Framework further. I, I fully accept that, that um, previous uh, governments have taken account of Parliament's views. That's, that's perfectly proper. The difference now is that the National Planning Framework is going to be part of the statutory development plan. That places it on a very, very different footing from what happened before. And it does provide, and perhaps you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong in this, it does provide the possibility that a future minority government could put things in the national planning framework to express their preferences that are against the wishes of committees in this parliament, uh, that are opposed by parliament, and yet will become part of the statutory development plan for planning authorities, because Parliament cannot say no 
to the national planning framework? Um, I understand uh, where Mr. Um, Whiteman is uh, is coming from uh, there. Um, I've already said I've got the um, the delegated powers and law reform committee um, report here. Um, I will consider the recommendations on the amendments uh, of national planning framework further. Um, okay, I will consider that. I think it might be because Mr. Simpson's initially a question. Mr. White, but Mr. Simpson's got a very specific point in relation to this for all for, for fairly obvious reasons, Mr. Simpson. Yeah. Um, um, thanks, Minister. I'm encouraged to hear that. Um, I just wonder if you can uh, go, go a bit further. Obviously, um, one of the recommendations of, of the uh, Delegated Powers Committee uh, was that the government should amend the bill so that significant amendments to the NPF resulting in a change to the overall policy become subject to specific public and parliamentary consultation requirements and that should be set out on the face of the bill. So are you saying today that you are willing to do that? What I've said today um, is that I've noted the recommendations of the Delegated Powers and Regulatory, Regulatory Reform Committee on this issue, and I'll consider them further at stage two. Um, you know, we are significantly um, enhancing Parliament's uh, ability uh, to scrutinise the national planning framework. Um, I have... Uh, not had this document very long, these recommendations um, from the Delegated Powers and, uh, uh, and Regulatory, Regulatory Reform Committee, um, and I will consider them further at stage two. Okay. Uh, Mr Whiteman. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll move on, but before I do so, I just want to note that the recommendations of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in relationship to consultation are not what I was asking about. I was asking about Parliament approving the national yeah. planning framework, putting it on a more democratically accountable footing, given that it is to be part of the Strategic Development Plan. Yeah. Moving on to the Strategic Development Plans, um, as Mr McNerney has, has noted, obviously the, the, the bill um, gets rid of, 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 of these. And I think it's fair to say, I think you reflect it in your policy memorandum, that there have been mixed views. Um, on this, and I think as a committee we have to obviously think carefully about what kind of recommendations we're going to make to Parliament on this question. We have had people like Clyde Plan who have come in and very, very successfully uh, produced uh, regional plans, uh, are very, very keen that they be maintained, and on, in principle there's no reason why they couldn't continue under voluntary arrangements. But I think there's a, a worry perhaps that if strategic planning, which is a kind of long-standing feature of the planning system is to be moved on to a voluntary uh, footing that there will be less incentive, obviously, for planning authorities to engage in it because of resources and all sorts of other uh, reasons. And in that context, it is quite notable that research that uh, Kevin Murray Associates did for the Scottish Government in 2014 effectively said that the answer, the, the um, I quote, the report has addressed the core question of whether the strategic development planning system in Scotland is fit for purpose. The answer is that the system is still bedding in. It is not yet it is not broken, nor is its potential yet fully optimised. So I'm wondering if you could reflect on the evidence that we've heard about the value of strategic uh, regional planning, uh, the high regard in which it's held outside Scotland, and whether, in fact, voluntary arrangements will deliver the same quality of strategic planning uh, as has been the case to date. Um, I'll start off with the Kevin Murray Associates report, and then I'll bring in... Um, Mr. Uh, McNerney. Um, although um, the report itself didn't recommend removing strategic development plans, uh, its conclusions and recommendations raised uh, very similar points uh, to the issues that we are now seeking to address um, around about stronger collaborative leadership, uh, greater uh, alignment of vision, strategy and delivery mechanisms, improved community engagement, awareness raising, uh, a more streamlined process for housing needs and demand assessments, better coverage of infrastructure, stronger links with wider community planning, improved action planning and a focus on delivering outcomes. Um, and the bill as a whole, together with the, plan, the wider planning reform, will ensure uh, m many of these uh, recommendations can happen. Um, if I can speak from, uh, before I bring in Mr uh, McNerney, um, from an entirely um, uh, practical uh, point of view 
um, is a, a, a constituency MSP. One of the things which um, frustrates uh, many folk who are or have tried to become involved in the planning process um, is um, that uh, shift from the local development plan to the strategic development plan, uh, and they don't understand all of that put together, which leads to confusion, uh, and they can't understand why they've been consulted on one plan and suddenly they're being consulted on another plan. And I think, you know, again, in terms of simplification, um, uh, you know, um, and getting rid of confusion, this is the right way forward. I'll bring in M Mr McNerney, convener, and if you will allow me uh, to come in at the end with a few other reflections, I'd be grateful. OK, thank you. Um, I would say we, we strongly support strategic... Um, planning. The National Planning Framework is a form of a strategic plan, albeit it's, um, it's national. Um, the changes both reflect the findings of the independent panel, and as, as you've reflected, there are different views around the country on this. Um, strategic development plans are currently focused on four areas, um, but there are other parts of Scotland um, that have cross-boundary cross, cross boundary issues, um, and it's also the case that um, the, the partnership working um, in different regions of Scotland might change over time. So at present Highland, the Ayrshires, Dumfries and Galloway, Falkirk, for example, um, aren't part of the STP network. Um, and we've, we've sought to provide a stronger uh, regional focus. There is already a regional perspective in National Planning Framework 3, which, which moves us on considerably from earlier versions. Um, and our... Um, proposals are that we simply strengthen that and that we co-produce the national planning framework with um, planning authorities working over different geographies um, to ensure that it can give regional perspectives, more uh, information regionally about infrastructure, about housing, etc., in a way that um, reduces some duplication and complexity from the system. There is also a feeling which I, I would share is that um, for a country of Scotland's size, we are approaching having too many plans. We have a national planning framework, SDPs, LDPs, um, community planning integrating with those and now local place plans. Um, and that comes with some baggage of consultation if it's going to happen um, in a way that's really inclusive and effective. Um, so the focus is drifting towards just making plans. So what, what you see here and is at the root of your question is actually a rationalisation. We think that things can work more effectively with a stronger national planning framework, not imposed necessarily. It has to be co-produced. Um, it has to um, have a strong element of um, what different authorities working together want to influence. As you say, I will take it for one final supplementary um, in a moment. Minister, do you need to add anything? It's fine. Uh, Mr McNerney has right. covered everything. Mr. Just to conclude, that, that's very helpful. Um, thank you very much. I suppose the worry is that by getting rid of strategic planning as a statutory thing, uh, there's a concern that we're kind of hollowing out the process. We're producing local place plans at the local level, but they don't have much statutory effect. And then we're having a national planning framework, which doesn't have much democratic scrutiny, but is part of the development plan. And that's, those are the kind of issues we have to grapple with. But I understand the rationale that's been laid out by Mr McNair, and I think you... Okay. I, I think the other thing is that we are, in changing circumstances, as Mr McNerney rightly pointed out, um, you know, at this moment, there are strategic development plans which uh, cover the four city regions and many areas don't have um, a, a, anything like that in place. This is the opportunity for more cooperation at a strategic level um, between uh, authorities. Um, you know, um, uh, Ayrshire is probably a good example in terms of getting the hopeful, uh, hopefully soon Ayrshire deal right. Uh, it would require um, strategic devel development cooperation across Ayrshire. Uh, and some of the situations that we've seen as, as things have developed means um, that we now have uh, different things at play uh, to what we had when strategic development plans were introduced. Uh, you know, um, uh, the, the city deals are a prime example uh, here, which Ms Gorith pointed out either uh, uh, earlier. So uh, I think there are opportunities still um, for the level of co cooperation in strategic planning um, without us being prescriptive uh, and without uh, being over Cumbersome, uh, cumbersome uh, on uh, folks out there who are often confused about the amount of planning that is going on. 
Okay. Um, just before we, you, you get, we all get that comfort break, Minister, uh, the contention was made there that the national planning framework doesn't have democratic scrutiny. My personal view is a huge amount of democratic scrutiny, massive, I would say. It's whether or not it should go to a final vote in the Scottish plan, Parliament, which is connected, but, but, the, but they are different beasts, I suppose. Um, what, what are the benefits of putting it to a vote in the Scottish Parliament, and are there any downsides? And the point I, was, I suppose I would make in relation to downsides would be, and, and I say this with full self-awareness here, um, the budget process, where there's a degree of horse trading and deals to be done to sign up or not sign up to an agreed budget in this place, might that be something that we put the national planning framework privy to if it goes to a full vote in the chamber of the Scottish Parliament? But what would you see the benefits of that being uh, and what might the drawbacks of that be? Um, from personal experience, uh, convener, I think that the uh, scrutiny of national planning framework for um, was particularly good. Um, as I said, um, you know, a number of the committees of this parliament were involved. Um, obviously, I, I think that that level uh, of scrutiny um, is, is grand. Um, I, I, I uh, would expect that level of scrutiny um, to continue. Um, I, I think that the parliament, as, uh, as it stands, uh, with what we have and what we propose, uh, has uh, a, a huge amount of, of oversight uh, to look at national planning framework for. I thought we'd draw you on that without, without any success, though, Minister. Uh, we're now going to go for about a five-minute comfort break, and after that, it's an hour, and that's it wrapped up, so we'll just have to frame our questions appropriately. Uh, we suspend for a few moments. Thanks.
still on agenda item one and we're consideration of the Planning Scotland bill that's before us and we'll continue with some questioning. Uh, Minister, can I perhaps move us on to the infrastructure levy, which is to a degree contained within the bill. That is as far as provisions to impose and implement an infrastructure levy are contained within the bill, but, but no detail. So from the government's point of view, the jury's still out whether or not this power should be exercised or not, and consideration has still been given. It's been contended that it won't actually raise, in the greater scheme of things, a significant amount of cash. So I'm just wondering what the latest considerations in government are in relation to why it's there, if you might not use it, uh, and in relation to the amount of uh, cash it's likely to uh, garner in, uh, Minister. Um, convener, um, I'm well aware of some of the evidence that you have taken um, and I, I know that infrastructure uh, delivery is one of the big, biggest challenges um, facing local authorities at this time. Uh, it's uh, important, I think, that the opportunity of in introducing an infrastructure levy uh, which could f facilitate um, development is not missed. Uh, the infrastructure levy itself uh, is not intended to fund all infrastructure uh, requirements, uh, nor would that be possible uh, for the scale of infrastructure requirements across the country. Um, although receipts are likely to be small uh, compared to total public sector infrastructure uh, spend, they would still have a, a positive impact on infrastructure delivery, um, for example, through levering uh, other funding. Um, Convener, we have done um, uh, uh, an amount of work on this um, and uh, had a, an independent report um, on uh, the levy itself um, and how it could possibly work. All of that information is available on the Scottish Government website and I'm sh sure uh, that many of you have, uh, have trawled through that. I think that there is a, a number uh, uh, of things that we need to still do to get this absolutely right. Um, uh, and that is why um, we're asking for the powers uh, to, 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 to introduce one, but not necessarily do so um, at this moment in time. Oh. If I could bring in Mr McNerney for maybe some more of the technicalities around about the work that we've done uh, around about the, the levy itself, convener. Just before you come in, Mr McNerney, because that, that's more, that more a kind of technical response, but just again for the time constraints that we have, is it a fair summation to say that in principle the government believes an infrastructure levy is the right thing to do, but in practice you want to make sure before it's implemented that, that you do get it right? Is that a fair summation of the Scottish correct. government's correct. position? Correct, um, convener. Absolutely correct. OK, uh, Mr McNerney, if you want to add. OK, I'll, I'll be very uh. brief. Um, the levy was also a recommendation of the independent panel. We've looked at it in the context that we recognise Section 75 has limitations. Its focus on restricting and regulating um, necessarily means that there has to be a very strong connection between a strong connection um, between the improvement and the site. Um, and as we've seen um, from at least one court case, um, as you stretch the boundaries of Section 75, um, you can fail to meet the tests. So the infrastructure levy. Um, is an opportunity that we don't we don't want to just close our minds to, and that's why we focused on research, but recognising more work needs to be done. Okay, I think that that is helpful. Um, it might also be worth just just seeking the minister's views in relation to something that's not in the bill. It could in theory be in the bill at the same section, because there's a lot of work going on just now with the Scottish Land Commission in relation to land value taxes. And again, I'm just keen to tease out whether if that's a direction of travel of the Scottish government. Although we're not quite sure how that might work in practice yet, if there's an opportunity to seek the powers to introduce through secondary legislation the idea of a land value tax within that section, if the principle would appear to be a good idea, and wouldn't this allow us to roll this out without having to go back to primary legislation to to achieve it? So is there a potential there to look at some of that? Um, convener, um, the, this bill is uh, not the place for that. 
and I think that we have got to allow other um, work uh, to continue on in this area. Um, the government has already um, said that it uh, will enhance compulsory um, purchase orders and refresh compulsory purchase order powers. Uh, we will look um, to introducing uh, compulsory sale uh, order legislation during the course of this Parliament. Uh, but probably um, more importantly, um, convener, we have got to allow um, the Scottish Land Commission uh, to uh, have a, a real hard look um, at land value taxes, which um, they are currently doing. Um, the committee uh, will have seen the uh, Land Commission's report last week, uh, which called for the, uh, the state to lead in, uh, in major public interest development. Uh, and whilst we are still considering um, uh, all of this, I think we've got to allow them uh, to, to do that work to get again to get that absolutely right, just like you know, um, uh, infrastructure levy. Okay, no, I, I, I accept that as the government reason minister, and you're not persuaded that that the provision to implement it, uh, land value tax well, should, should, should be within there. But the distinction, no. of course, would be that the infrastructure levy is not good to go yet either, but that is going to be... Uh, but the, the, diff the difference between all of that, convener, is that we have consulted on the infrastructure lev levy. Uh, we have not consulted um, on land value capture or compulsory order uh, sale orders or compulsory purchase orders. And that would have to be done, um, convener, and that would would have to be uh, done absolutely right. I think it's um, absolutely vital um, that we uh, look at, at what the uh, Scottish uh, Land uh, Commission comes up with in this regard, uh, and then we move forward uh, doing the right and appropriate thing uh, in terms of co consulting on any propositions that we put forward. Okay, F final question. Back to the principle of it again, Minister, and I, 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 I accept what you're saying there. So, I mean, it's always dangerous to give a local example, but I stay in the Somerston part of my constituency in Maryhill and Springburn, where all the fields across the road, and I know one of the houses, but it used to be a field a few years ago, all the fields across the road were greenbelt up until the latest iteration of local development plan. That has now changed, opening the window for development there. Forget about the rights or wrongs of that, and whether it's nimbyistic or whatever, forget about all those things. But I would suspect the land value there has substantially went up considerably because of that redesignation within the local development plan. In principle, should some of that be captured for the public purse? Um, I'm not going to speculate in, uh, about your area or any other uh, in, in that regard, convener. Um, as I've said, um, we have consulted on infrastructure levy. Um, uh, we're moving forward in that. Um, we think there's still a little bit of, of work to do. But in terms of land value capture, compulsory purchase orders, compulsory sale orders, uh, we have not consulted on that. We would have to get that absolutely right. Um, and I think that you know those are discussions um, for a, a later date. OK. Um, Mr Simpson's got a supplementary on that. Um, yes, um, and I'll come <coughs> back again to the uh, report of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee, uh, where they looked at the infrastructure levy, uh, and they make the point that the powers are drawn very widely. They inhibit the Parliament for, from conducting line-by-line -line scrutiny of policy. Um, and uh, among three recommendations is that a, an enhanced um, form of scrutiny called super affirmative procedure should be um, uh, on, on the face of the bill. So when you, if you do decide what you want to do, uh, that Parliament can properly scrutinise it. Um, I gave my answer to the committee that uh, Mr Simpson convenes. I'm happy to look at the affirmative procedure um, for that. Beyond that, um, I was questioned uh, around about this 
um, at the um, Finance Committee um, uh, following an appearance at, at Mr Simpson's committee uh, and basically um, uh, was asked the question, is this um, a way for the um, Scottish Government uh, to um, uh, attract further um, uh, resource for itself? Uh, to which I responded to uh, Mr Simpson's colleague, uh, Murdo Fraser, uh, no, um, this is not um, the ability um, for uh, Mr Mackay uh, to add to his budget. Okay. Um, only because of uh, time constraints, Mr Simpson, you've got that on the record now. Uh, hopefully we can, we can move on to the next, the next line of questioning. Thank you for that. Um, Mr Gibson. <coughs> Excuse me, you can read it, actually. Yes, regarding the authority, uh, planning authority's performance, a number of uh, stakeholders have raised uh, concerns, obviously, about, for example, the length of delay in actual um, applications that are being processed. So I'm just wondering how you can actually monitor um, the performance. Uh, should it, for example, be on the, on the quality of outcome, or should it be the speed by which um, the, the planning application is processed, or hopefully a combination of the two? For asking, for, for asking some questions. He's, he's, he's feeling poorly this morning, so thank you for persevering. Thanks, Convener. Um, uh, thank you, Convener, and uh, I wish a speedy recovery, Mr Gibson. Um, in terms of uh, planning authorities and performance, um, Mr Gibson is absolutely right. It's something that comes up uh, on a regular basis um, uh, all over um, the place, I have to say. Um, planning authorities, of course, um, lead the delivery, excuse me, of the planning service in their areas. Uh, they have the primary responsibility uh, for managing the operation of that system. Um, I acknowledge, uh, convener, that sometimes applicant behaviour um, uh, plays a, a part in planning performance too, um, as do the parts played by other stakeholders um, involved in the process. Um, and we have uh, commissioned uh, research on barriers to decision making to get a, a more uh, rounded picture of where delays actually lie. Um, how we um, view performance has moved on uh, a little bit in recent years. Um, uh, speed of delivery um, is, is still a vital element of uh, good performance, uh, but there is uh, more uh, to it all than that. Um, the, the planning performance framework uh, and key markers um, already recognise planning performance uh, is about whole service um, delivery. Uh, the policy memorandum of the bill uh, states that the bill will increase scrutiny of the full extent of planning authority performance and how authorities carry out uh, their functions and deliver their services on their quality of decision making and on the outcomes uh, for their area. And that sets out how I see that going forward. Uh, a holistic approach to managing and improving performance across all of planning. Uh, and as I've said already, um, we've commissioned research uh, on all of this, uh, and I intend to keep a close eye, and the form and content of performance reports themselves um, will be defined following uh, consultation, and we'll continue to work with the high-level uh, working group on planning and other stakeholders to develop this. Yeah, and just to follow up, I mean, how will that, the the performance monitoring um, blend in with the, the, the performance monitoring that there already is in the system? What, what real differences will it make? Will there be a, any overlap, or will it be as seamless as one would hope it would be? Um, the bill's provisions uh, will complement uh, other uh, things that are already in the system. Um, I expect um, uh, that they will formalise, improve and replace current arrangements. Um, as uh, folk are, are well aware, um, we have uh, 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 talked of appointing uh, a performance coordinator in the bill. 
Um, some folks see that as a, a massive threat or again, uh, me uh, trying to um, uh, exercise authority or power. Um, but the, uh, the uh, uh, coordinator themselves, the role I see it, um, is to ensure that best practice um, is exported uh, across the piece. Um, to help authorities uh, who may have um, particular uh, difficulties. Um, and uh, for those who think um, that this may be an additional burden, um, what I would say is in terms of the requirement um, for uh, authorities to report what is going on in their areas, that is already there. Um, in their annual uh, report and performance. Um, and I would dispute that that was an additional burden. OK, and just one last, one, one last question, <laughs> if I can, convener. Um, in, in terms of the, the planning performance coordinator and the um, performance assessor, um, why is it that their functions are not actually included directly in the bill, uh, whereas in other pieces of legislation, such roles have been included, for example, in, in terms of prison inspection? Um, convener, the, the general functions of the coordinator are set out in the face of the bill, uh, and the regulations will provide <coughs> further details uh, of a, 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 a technical and administrative level, for example, on how that performance is to be monitored and how often reports should be prepared. Um, the coordinator is a separate role from a person appointed to conduct an assessment uh, of a planning authority's performance. Uh, the assessor uh, can be appointed to carry out an in-depth assessment and make recommendations on any particular aspect of an authority's performance or of its performance generally uh, and the scope of all of that to be tailored as appropriate. I'll bring in Mr McNearney for some of the more technical aspects um, of this <coughs> convener and also to save my voice a bit. Mr okay. um, well, some of this is, is um, agreed informally, but it's not um, before now been put in legislation. Um, but the coordinator will, will essentially look to improve performance um, to help share good practice and also report to ministers on um, um, how performance is improving um, over the course of, of the year. Um, the assessor is, of course, in, entirely different and is looking at a particular issue about performance um, and, and um, again, reporting to, to ministers. Um, so, the, so the direction of travel is to ensure that we can improve performance and um, that there, there are some teeth on the face of the bill as we approach um, thinking also about um, improving the, the resourcing of the system as well. There's a connection between the two. Okay. Now, um, some bids for supplementaries in relation to this. I'm just going to name check so people know that I've got, they've got my attention. Uh, Monica Lennon, Graham Simpson, and I think Alexander Stewart. Okay, so <coughs> only because of time constraints, if possible, relatively brief supplementaries and responses, oh, Minister. I, uh, I know, uh, Ms Lennon. Okay, on performance, so the Scottish Government expects planning authorities to use processing agreements for all major applications and for other complex local developments. Um, Minister, are you happy with the uptake of processing agreements and does the government have any evidence um, as to how they might be improving um, performance or, uh, or delivery? I'll bring in uh, Mr McNerney in terms of processing agreements. Um, I know that he has uh, opinions on all of this and I'll add to okay. that. Um, I think there's been a slow take up on processing agreements. Um, initially, Edinburgh, I think, were um, at the forefront of this and um, it was clear from their experience that in terms of dealing with difficult major applications as a project management tool, um, processing agreements were very positive. Um, and I think that they generally are positive, and so we've we've continued to try and promote them. Um, it's not something that we can compel developers to enter into because it is an agreement. Or local um, authorities. Or local authorities. But I think take up has has over the last five years it has improved from a very low level. I think um, is it 1,200 now we see annually. It's um, it's uh, I've got the latest figures in front of me in terms of processing agreements and. 2015-16, there were 680. Uh, in 2016-17, there were 1,503. From that data, Minister, are you able to tell um, for what reason that the clock is being stopped? Is it 
lack of information from developers? Is it delays with other consultees? Do you have that kind of information? Um, I'll bring Mr McNairney in and then I'll uh, make some comment myself about clock stopping um, and the uh, level of attention that I have been paying to this. Um, Mr McNairney first, please. Um, we don't have information in every case. Um, the information that we have relates to um, returns where there are particularly lengthy cases and the authorities will provide us with reasons. Sometimes it might be um, a staffing um, issue, uh, workload, it could be an agency's delay, it could be information um, sought during the process not yet provided. These are, these are common reasons, as is Section 75 delays, which probably accounts for about 50% of the overall processing times for major developments. So we don't scrutinise every case. Um, but where, where um, originally agreed timescales are not met, um, there should be agreement by both parties to what the extended period would be. And my, uh, my understanding is that between 60 and 70 per cent of processing agreements um, do meet the timescale. So uh, that's one of the ingredients in, in taking the view that they are, they are overall um, a good thing. Okay. Um, convener, um, if I can just add to that, because I've been paying uh, particular attention um, around about things like clock stopping, and I, I, I've been receiving um, uh, regular um, information, although sometimes that information uh, is a little bit scant, um, because I have concerns that, you know, it's sometimes far too easy um, to blame the local authority for something when it may not necessarily uh, be the local authority that's at fault in terms of their performance. Uh, it would be fair to say, um, Convener, um, as I said, that some of the information is scant. It would be fair to say that there is probably not um, enough being done in this area, um, and that's why you know we have com commissioned research uh, on uh, reasons for delay um, uh, and to explore um, the barriers uh, to decision making. Um, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm sure that uh, uh, the committee will want to have a look at that research uh, once it's complete. Um, I don't have the time scales for that off the yeah. top of my head. And looking at me, um, I don't either. I, but I, but I think we'll, it's we'll keep you in the loop on yeah. that. Sure. Okay. I mean, I think it's perhaps unfortunate that that research wasn't commissioned earlier because we've heard anecdotally that planning is a barrier, planning is a slow process, it's bureaucratic, and often people are saying that the, the problem lies with planning authorities and with planners and people who work in, in that department. But we just don't really know what's Could causing delays, and there's complexities out there that are sometimes unavoidable. Um, there is data that's reported back to government. There's going to be research, but I wonder what that research will tell us because we're making some, I don't know, that's why we're having the research. significant changes. Well, we've been asked to look at a planning bill where we're sort of tinkering and making quite transformative changes, but we just don't know what's what's causing delay and blockage. So um, an early indication is, on... Is there, a, is there a question in there? Well, an early indication on, on that research would be helpful. C C convener, um, if we look um, at what I said at the very beginning, we're on a journey heel here. The bill is not the be-all and end-all of all of this. We have commissioned a huge amount of research in various areas um, as we have progressed from the independent planning review all the way through to all of the stakeholder engagement. And we will continue um, uh, to uh, ensure that we have got all of the information available. One of the reasons why... Yeah, one of the reasons why we have commissioned this research is because I've not been particularly happy uh, with all of the information that we have. I don't think it's uh, enough. That's why we're doing that. We'll send you a note about timeline and obviously we'll share that research once it's complete. OK, Mr Simpson. Thanks. Uh, very uh, quick question and it follows on from what uh, Mr Gibson uh, manfully managed to get out earlier. Um, um, how? But, but basically, um, in, the, in the bill, um, when it talks about assessing uh, a planning authority's performance, <coughs> it says that you, uh, ministers, presumably yourself, um, would appoint someone to look at a planning authority's performance. Um, uh, they, they, you know, they would look at the, the functions to be assessed, uh, etc. But it doesn't, it doesn't spell out in any detail 
at what is meant by performance and what kind of things you would be looking at. Do you think that's something that could be um, sorted out at but possibly stage two? I'll take in Mr McNairney first, please, convener. Um, well, it, it, it could be it could be wide, and um, we haven't specified that. Um, it could be around um, the, the instance that I gave earlier, around say section seventy five. There can be particular themes that that um, are at the root of delay, but it could also be around how stakeholders are dealt with, yeah. um, and particularly community interests. So it's it's not it's not intended to be focused on speed of approval, for example, but in uh, the holistic way in which we want to look at performance. Yeah, so, it's, so it's very wide, it's a very, very wide power. That, what, that's, that's my point. So perhaps you could spell things out more in the bill. I think that's a substantial question, and, and I'm not trying to take the question off your toes, it's a time constraint thing. I think, will there be more information available ahead of stage two in mm. relation to this is the substantive point. It's just so we, 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 we can provide the committee with more detail ar around about this convener, um, but it has to be uh, uh, said that you know, in terms of communication that I get as minister and um, uh, and the others probably receive as as, as members, um, you know. Um, Issues around about performance uh, can be wide and varied, and they um, uh, are often um, raised by um, uh, by members of the public rather than by any other stakeholders around about the performance aspect. Uh, but we'll get you more detail. That'd be helpful. Apologies, for that, Mr. Simpson. Just uh, well, allow Mr. Stewart to ask <coughs> questions. Thank you. I mean, performance is vitally important. Everyone understands that, uh, but. As we've touched on already, you know, the, the pressures of work within a planning department, the resources implications, the workforce planning, uh, you know, customer satisfaction with the developers and individuals, they all come into this mix about performance. Uh, and it's how you manage that to, to ensure that what, what you're intending to put through in the bill uh, does become a reality. Because I think there is a, an apprehension that there's a, uh, there's a sanction or there's a control uh, coming through on this. Uh, uh, and how that is going to be perceived by, by, by councils themselves. Uh, you know, as I say, depending on which planning department in the country you're involved in, you may have thousands of applications or you may only have a handful. So uh, you're, you're, you're going to have to try and gauge uh, how, that, how that's best worked. Uh, but but my, my question is, you know, the, the whole idea of control and sanction, is that the intention for this? Uh, I'll take Mr McNerney first and then I'll come in, convener. Um, it's in, it, the intention is that there is some control. Mm -hmm. um, in practice, we actually work very positively with stakeholders in the system. So it might well be that some of the elements, um, the, the assessor and directing authorities, are very much um, instances of the last resort, um, but they are there. Um, when there were provisions in the, in the 2006 bill um, around assessment, um, they actually weren't they weren't, they weren't implemented because um, things moved on and we moved to a, a, a performance framework um, and a collaborative approach to improving performance. Um, but as we move into the territory of significant fee increases, um, we, we need to have some mechanism um, to ensure that those who are, who are, are paying um, for full cost recovery um, can expect uh, a reasonable service in return for that. So, so. A, a value for money situation you're intending then? Um, well, well, sorry, the Minister was uh, going to come it's, in. It, it's, it's not just about that. You know, I, I think one of the things which um, uh, can be frustrating at points um, is, you know, I will get crossing my desks, uh, as, as we all do from time to time, uh, this is a problem, how are you going to deal with it? Um, and there is nothing at this moment um, at uh, our disposal uh, in terms of dealing um, with performance. Now, you know, I um, always prefer um, a carrot rather than stick. Um, I prefer um, a light touch um, uh, where that's at all possible. And I would prefer this role, um, uh, these roles to be seen as positive. Um, in terms of trying to ensure uh, that we export best practice um, right across the country. Um, but, you know, um, I think uh, uh, we uh, will uh, see uh, what occurs here. 
the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Uh, but the vast bulk um, of, of of things that uh, cross my desk are not necessarily the things that um, folk would expect. And in terms of performance, um, I, I, I think it would be fair to say that in recent times, uh, most of the complaints that I've had about performance are from community community groups uh, around about certain authorities, which I will not name here, convener. OK. Thank you. There's just probably on to the next line of question, which will be Andy Whiteman, just <coughs> giving you a heads up there. If, if this was the NHS and we're monitoring performance, one of the things that has been brought in is, um, is it care opinion or patient opinion? Uh, uh, the name escapes me now, where care opinion, where uh, good, bad and indifferent experiences of the NHS is able almost in real time to be put out there and captured and garnered. And one of the things that I found was actually you don't necessarily get to hear about the good stuff as well as the negative stuff. I'm just wondering what, this, in relation to uh, monitoring performance, uh, to have a positive side to this, what is there in relation to planning opinion that could be captured about whether it's an individual person who sought to build an extension to their house and actually had really supportive and seamless planning process or a community group that made representations in pre-consultation and felt they were listened to when the substantive planning application was put in? Is there a whole depth of data out there in relation to get a flavour of performance that we're maybe missing, and is that something we could act on? Well, in this life, uh, convener, sometimes we uh, hear the bads rather than the good, and I'm um, in the position where sometimes I hear um, the good as well um, as the bad, and there is um, good practice uh, going out, uh, going on out there in many p places, and um, we um, celebrate um, that good practice on a regular basis. Um, just recently. Um, I had the good fortune to be able to attend the um, planning awards and beyond that, that provides the opportunity for folk to network and to share um, the good practice um, that is uh, going out there. In terms of throughout the um, re review, um, you know, we, we would look at 360-degree um, uh, feedback as part of, uh, of, of monitoring. Uh, maybe Mr McNerney would like to add more uh, in terms of, of uh, data that we have. Um, in terms of uh, uh, care opinion, I think that's run by an independent organisation. Mm -hmm. I think it is, mm -hmm. it is kind of useful. So, I'm not trying to bounce uh, the uh, government minister. So I, I would have would yes been. No. Are you sympathetic uh, to that uh, kind of uh, uh, platform? I, I'm, simple, the question I'm sympathetic I'm to the monitoring that I've talked about. Um, Mr McNair. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, authorities will take feedback from their stakeholders. They'll include that at present in some of their planning performance um, returns. Um, so there is an indication, there's 15 markers in the performance framework. Um, so it is quite wide. But we probably don't celebrate the good things enough or promote them. There's tons of good practice in the planning system um, across a, big, a, a wide spectrum of activity. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll certainly reflect on what you've said about care opinion, mm -hmm. convener. Okay, thank you. That's appreciated. Mr Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much. Just briefly want to raise some equality issues. Uh, Engender have drawn to our attention the fact that, of course, if the planning system is to be fully inclusive, uh, it must uh, be that. And the planning is a very gendered issue. They, they cite examples from uh, Vienna, for example, where they've in, incorporated um, gender equality in, the, in urban planning. Now, the equality impact assessment obviously needs to critically engage with gendered issues, um, but they argue that the planning bill doesn't achieve this, and they say that in terms of gender, the planning bill equal equality impact assessment is, and I quote, exceptionally uh, bad. They will also go on to say that at present it does not meet minimum standards set out by law and thus cannot assist the committee in adequately considering equality dimensions uh, of the bill. I'm just wondering what your reaction to that is. Uh, I've only just recently seen the Engender report, as in this morning. I will have a, a look through that and reflect on it. Uh, obviously, uh, convener, I uh, am someone who uh, believes uh, completely and utterly in equality. Um, I'll have a look at that and reflect. Thank you. Thanks for putting it on the record. The committee's only just had, had the opportunity to look at it ourselves, but wanted to make sure that we'd put that on the record. So moving on now, uh, can I bring in our Deputy Convener, Monica Lennon? Um, I would have been more reassured to hear some defence of the quality impact assessment, but we look forward to getting more information um, from the government. We've heard a lot in evidence about 
front loading. It was an aspiration of the, the previous planning bill and it remains an aspiration in, in this planning bill. Can you tell us, Minister, what is front loading and, and why are we not yet in touching distance of it? Um, I don't agree um, with Miss Lennon, first of all, um, because I don't think uh, front uh, loading has uh, failed. Uh, but I think that it can be uh, improved and in some cases um, dramatically improved. Um, we talked about uh, the celebration of uh, where we get things right. Uh, we have seen extremely good um, examples of public engagement uh, to capture um, the views and opinions of local pe people um, in places like Aberdeen and Dundee, um, at Highland uh, and Tayplan have been recognised for their work with communities, including uh, children and young people, which uh, uh, we talked about earlier. Um, the uh, Charette programme itself has been a very good example, um, and we touched uh, briefly upon play standard earlier on, uh, which in my opinion has been uh, very successful. Um, more uh, can be done, um, without a doubt, to embed uh, front loading uh, through our proposals for the national planning framework, um, development planning, local place plans, uh, and SDZs, uh, and of course, uh, pre-application consultations. Um, so I think that more can be done um, in that regard, but I do not agree um, with the concept that front-loading has failed, uh, because in many areas uh, there have been success stories. Okay. Well, it's interesting you gave Tape Plan as an example of success, because Tape Plan will be abolished, I believe, under the proposals. But we've heard in evidence that public confidence and trust in planning is quite low, and we've heard examples of how communities do feel disengaged and not listened to. If we focus on pre-application consultation for, for a second, um, we've heard in evidence that community groups feel like some developers approach these exercises like a tick box exercise and from the way that, that notice is given of public meetings um, in terms of what happens in the meetings, what's reported back to the council, people don't really feel that it really adds value and it really changes anything. Do you recognise those um, concerns, Minister? Um, convener, I, I think that in some cases, um, you know, we have seen again some good practice in terms of um, uh, pre-application. Um, and I think that in a lot of cases, again, we lose sight of the fact that many um, developers um, do a, a huge amount of work um, in terms of consulting uh, and bringing community uh, views into play. Um, a, a few examples uh, off the top of my head, um, you know, Craig Inch's prison at Aberdeen, um, which is a uh, uh, housing for Key Workers Development by Sanctuary Housing Association. Um, at the cutting of the uh, ground there, um, I had the opportunity to talk to local residents who were also there, uh, who felt extremely included all the way through that process, uh, including um, uh, you know, a, a number of uh, the original plans were changed. Uh, to take um, cognizance uh, of their views. So I think that in, uh, in many cases, um, what we are seeing um, is a change uh, in attitude in that regard. Still a way to go in some places. Um, and uh, I think a, a wise uh, applicant uh, will take cognizance uh, of the views uh, of the folk in the area where the application is. Okay, now again, in, in evidence, we've, we've heard from a, a range of stakeholders, particularly community groups, that they don't feel that there is a, a level playing field. They can't match developers in terms of resource and, and expertise and also legal rights in the process. So <coughs> that brings us to a point where, um, so 12 years on from the last planning bill, there's a, there's a growing um, debate and demand for equalising the system and an equal right of appeal. Now, Minister, you, you did write a couple of days ago yep. um, to, to put on record that the, gov the government is, is firmly opposed to an equal right of appeal. Um, is that totally in principle against equalising appeal rights? Um, convener, um, uh, we have made it um, clear um, that we agree 
um, with the independent uh, planning uh, review panel um, who uh, did not uh, uh, put forward uh, an equal right of appeal. Um, I think that an equal right of appeal um, will add uh, conflict at the end of the system. Um, and I would rather um, that we concentrate on the beginning of the system uh, to try and get people together um, to iron out differences um, and to uh, have a situation uh, where you know agreement uh, in many cases uh, can be reached, um, like um, I outlined um, with the sanctuary development at Craig Inches. I think that that is the much better way of, of dealing with this. And I think if we uh, end up in a situation um, with equal right of appeal, uh, in many places what we will see um, is a situation where um, communities and developers um, right from the very beginning, will be concentrating in the uh, in the conflict at the end, rather than sitting down uh, and discussing what's required for a community. So you mentioned the independent panel. Um, we've had written evidence from Scottish Environment Link, and they say that the issues around equal rights of appeal were not fully explored by the independent panel. The issue was touched on briefly only and not given the depth of consideration such a fundamental issue requires. Well, I'll, I'll take in Mr Minster? McNerney um, uh, after this convener because Mr McNerney obviously um, was in post um, when the independent pa uh, panel was carrying out um, the review. I was not planning minister at that time. Although but you I must kept have a close. view on the panel's work. Well, I, I do have a view, and if you would uh, allow me, uh, I'll give you that view. Um, I think it would be unfair to say that the independent panel um, did not take views of people, all people in this regard. And I'll take in Mr McNerney, who will have more information on exactly what the independent panel did around the country in that regard. Just before you come in, Mr McNerney, there's a lot of interest from MSPs for supplementary entries in relation to this, myself included, uh, and I want to afford everyone the opportunity to come in. So I'm just signalling to everyone, get my attention now if you wish to come in, because if you don't, then we will run out of time in relation to that. Uh, Mr McNearney. The, the panel did, um, the panel issued a, a call for uh, evidence, um, and they took written and oral evidence, and there was a number of questions that, that they set out. I don't have all of them in front of me, but one of them was um, around this general area, around um, the balance of rights and can improvements be made. Now, um, that was part of the context against which people offered views, and uh, that there were people who offered uh, the view that there should be a third party or equal right of appeal, and there would be others that took a different view. So it's not that the, the, um, the review panel didn't consider it, um, but having considered it and provided um, um, their 48 recommendations, one of which was um, not to have um, a change to the, to the appeal rights, we then um, did not pursue that actively. So we didn't have a separate consultation um, on rights of appeal, um, but we did set out our position in the consultation that, that issued last year. And again, people have, throughout the process, made their views known. Um, but following the recommendations of the independent panel, ministers set out their um, their statement following that. And it, it was broadly supportive, including that there should be no significant change to um, rights, of, rights of appeal. A couple of weeks ago, we heard evidence from Petra Bieberbach, as you know, was on the independent review panel. And we know on the record that she's not in favour of equal rights of appeal, but in the discussion, she accepted that there should now be a debate about it. Um, but why would there need to be an ongoing debate if it's firmly not not the right thing to do? I mean, she she recognises people's concerns and frustrations with the system, and that there should be an ongoing debate. But I, I recognise um, people's um, frustrations, and you know I, what I the last thing that I want to do is to add to those frustra frustrations. If we look at um, the um, uh, response. Um, from the Scottish Alliance for People and Places. Um, they uh, say in their response to the committee, uh, we are concerned that the introduction of this measure will create further conflict between communities and other stakeholders in our places and undermine the collective ambition 
for a positive front-loaded planning system that incentivises participation at the very beginning and throughout the process. And I, I agree with that. I would much rather that we deal with this rather at the very beginning, um, because at the end of the day, um, if, if uh, we were to reach a, a position um, of uh, equalisation of right of appeal, I uh, can foresee a, a huge amount of conflict at the end and not many folk uh, speaking at the very beginning uh, when is, it is actually the time to speak okay. to one another. I'll bring in Mr McNerney again. Again, just very briefly. Um, I think stakeholders um, focus on a particular issue and the whole system is, is relevant to this issue too. So a lot of frustration that communities see is that um, they actually don't have the certainty that we want them to have about what site's going to be developed. So the development plan and then changes to the development plan are really key here because if we can get better information uh, from developers about how deliverable sites are, that these are carefully considered at the gate, the gate check and beyond, we get everything right, um, we will have a plan that um, stakeholders generally can have some confidence in. The problem at present is that um, shortcomings in, say, effect of housing land emerge at the end of the process and that causes tension for all stakeholders. That all sounds very persuasive, but this bill is also proposing that, that ministers can come along and designate simplified development zones, even though you've got a development plan that's been adopted, the community might not want it. That brings in more conflict. So it doesn't seem consistent, Minister, that you're bringing in other processes, but you're firmly closing the door to communities having anywhere near the rights that developers have. Um, Convener, um, I'm yeah. not going to go back to simplified development zones because uh, all uh, of what I've said um, is on the record in that regard. Um, my fear, um, my great fear, um, is uh, that there is uh, already um, uh, too much conflict and mistrust in the system. Um, and I think that uh, uh, equal right of appeal, third party right of appeal, um, can only add to that. Um, uh, developers and communities, in some cases, would be much more likely um, to adopt a tactical approach aiming uh, to win an appeal rather than to engaging at the outset. And I think that initial engagement is absolutely vital. Uh, and that is why the emphasis uh, on, uh, in this bill is uh, dealing uh, with the, all of this at the very beginning. Um, as I've already said, um, we are following um, the recommendations uh, of the independent panel. I think it is unfair to say that they did not, did not discuss this issue um, in depth, because they did. Uh, and even though um, uh, we have made it clear um, from the beginning that the government was not in favour um, of this. Uh, those discussions have still took place, uh, taken place at many of the fora uh, which I have attended and many, many more um, that Mr McNearney um, and his colleagues um, have attended. Uh, and with that, I'll bring in Mr McNearney, uh, convener. Well, as I say, we didn't do a separate consultation on, on rights of appeal, but people have, have made their views known throughout the, throughout the last two years. Actually. Okay. Um, bring other members in in a moment. I, I mean, I think it's reasonable to say that uh, whether or not uh, anyone, including this committee, were called for evidence in relation to planning, explicitly asked for views on equal right of appeal, we will get it anyway. Yeah, um, so I, th I think that, that that's a reasonable thing to say. We've had substantial evidence, uh, both in favour and against equal right of, right of appeal. So, uh, Minister, it's reasonable, to, to, I suppose, to make reference to, to your letter. You, you, you mention, you make a point, I think you're trying to make a point here, Minister, in relation to that since 2014, around 5,500 housing units have been approved uh, in developments because of a developer's right to appeal. And some, not all, but some of the proponents of equal right of appeal say that could be by taking away the developer's right to appeal. Does that mean you've got concerns in relation to meeting national house building targets, for example? Um, convener, I, I have uh, the, the dilemma 
um, uh, uh, but also the huge opportunity um, of being in the post that I'm in. And that leads to different conversations with dif different people, or sometimes very strange conversations um, around about, um, uh, about some of these issues. Um, and I'll give you an example, because I spoke to a woman, and I'm sorry if I'm uh, going over old ground, I may have told this story before, but I, I spoke with a woman who said, we uh, need more housing in this area, Minister. Um, desperately need more housing in this area. Um, and the next um, line was that you kind of build them here, here, here and here. And there is a balance to be struck around about what the housing needs um, uh, of an area are um, and, you know, planning uh, for that um, uh, properly. As I pointed out uh, in my letter, there are also other things um, which um, can often be seen as controversial um, but are entirely necessary um, that have been decided uh, upon uh, in, in an appeal um, situation. So I'm not sure, Minister, whether or not... I'm trying to be helpful. We're giving every other set of witnesses their opportunity to put sure. on the record what their views are in relation to, to this issue. You mentioned in, in the annex of your letter the 5,500 households, so 5,500 families staying in houses just now that may not have had those houses Correct. had developers not had the right to appeal. So do you have concern over that or not? Because you, you talked about, I feel like, an imbiastic approach from some people. But yeah. do you have concerns over national strategic targets if we move to withdrawing a developer's right to appeal? Uh, that is a possibility that, you know, if you have a situation that may not be a national problem, but you could have a, 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 a problem in a particular area um, where, you know, the decision taken uh, or decisions taken is not to build any homes um, when there's quite clearly housing need and demand in that particular area. And if there's not the ability um, uh, for appeal in that regard, um, does that mean that we are not going to build homes in those areas and not meet the needs of the people in those areas? OK, one final question. I want other members to come in. I'm just trying, trying to you know, interrogate the, the letter that you sent us. One of the, 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 the suggestions is that recognised community groups should have a, a right to appeal. So that might deal with Mr Whiteman's problem about his uh, sister in Switzerland would not be part of it. I don't think she should be part of a recognised community group, but, but you, you never know. Um, the point I'm trying to get to is, you, I think what you're saying, Minister, is that if we were to go down this road, it would be quite difficult to identify what a recognised community group would be or what that would look like. I know from my local experience, and sometimes I agree with folk who say, I just don't want development here. I'm one of those people sometimes. You know, we, all, we all have our own self-interest along the way. I've got that awareness. But th there's maybe a feeling that I'm sensing from your letter that there will be some people who are just always against things. Uh, an equal right of appeal would almost automatically trigger um, a number of appeals because that's the position some people take. Sometimes I'm in that position uh, in relation to local development. So a bit about what a recognised community group would look like, how that could be defined, or would it just build resistance to developments at the outset of the process if we were to go down this road? I think defining a recognised community group would be very difficult indeed, and there would be arguments around about what a recognised community um, uh, group actually is. Um, that's why um, I'm not in favour of this. The government is not in favour of this. Um, you know, you could um, you, you could argue about defini uh, definition for forever. Uh, some folk have suggested, you know, that um, uh, a recognised community group um, should be a community council, for example. Um, but we all know that um, uh, many of the community councils across the country are not reflective of the views of the communities um, that they purport to represent. Um, and I can only talk from my own experience um, uh, as a, a, an elected member. Um, you know, I've actually, um, uh, uh, in my uh, course of years over um, the uh, time of being a councillor and a parliamentarian, where I've um, come across uh, folk and groups who have said that they will oppose any development in a community, even though that development uh, is included. Um, I've come across uh, a community council which was formed uh, initially um, uh, to uh, oppose uh, changes to a park 
um, uh, you know, which again was not reflective uh, of the views of the community. I think um, uh, having a, a, a situation where designated community groups have the right to uh, uh, equal right of appeal um, opens up a can of worms which will create even greater conflict uh, and may actually lead to a huge amount of community division. Okay, we've got a supplementary in relation to that from Monica Lane. If I can just explore that point, because if community councils are in a lot of places unrepresentative, why do they have statutory rights in the planning system and why are you giving them the power to bring forward local place plans? Um, convener, uh, we, will, uh, we, we are where we are in terms of legislation and uh, community councils have those powers um, from the 1973 Act. Um, obviously, uh, we are uh, embarking uh, on a local governance view in co cooperation uh, with local government and community partners uh, and we will look at all aspects of these things during the course of that local governance okay. review. So are we saying that local um, sorry, community councils can be trusted to bring forward local place plans, but they can't be trusted to make judgments on whether what, or not they should make appeals. What, what to I'm saying decisions. is that um, bodies can bring forward um, local uh, place plans. I don't think it necessarily has to be um, community councils um, uh, convener. Um, and as I say, in terms okay. of some of the responsibilities um, of local authorities, uh, they are um, from the 1970s, um, and uh, of course, um, uh, like all of the other aspects of what we're embarking on in terms of that local governance review, that will be looked at as well. Okay, thank you. Now, given a time check, we will close this session at 12.20. Um, Andy Whiteman to follow up on Elena question. Very briefly, thank you, um, convener. Um, I, I have here the questions that the independent review panel asked in their consultation, and uh, I don't see any that ask a question and rights of appeal, just for the record. There was one question about do we need to change the system to ensure everyone has a fair hearing, etc. But, um, Minister, you, you said that you're um, on this question, you're following the recommendations of the independent review. The independent review only talked about third party right of appeal. In recommendation uh, 46, for example, it recommended that it, there should not be a third party right of appeal. It didn't ask any questions about appeals. It didn't say anything about the applicant's right of appeal. So can you confirm that on the question of whether an applicant's right of appeal should remain unreformed, the independent review didn't say anything? Um, I haven't got the report in front of me, um, okay. so I, I can't say yea or nay to that. Okay, thanks very much. And just very one brief uh, supplementary as well. Um, in your letter to the um, committee, you say that, for example, they... The idea that rights of appeal could be uh, tied to uh, consistency with the local development plan, uh, compliance with the local development plan, you say that would be very difficult to determine. Yet, as I understand it, prior to 2006, local planning authorities were required to notify ministers of decisions that represented a departure from the plan. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a number of other, um, in planning policy one, required planning authorities to notify ministers if they were minded to grant permission for a planning application where proposals represent a significant departure from the approved structure plan. So can I suggest that planning authorities are well used to making such judgments? Uh, I think they uh, did some of that in the past, but I'll take Mr McNerney in in terms of, of some of this. I'd also like to come back, convener. Okay, um, but all that you say is, is true, um, but in arriving at the judgment whether um, authorities would advertise, for example, a development has been contrary to the development plan. Um, it was certainly not clear cut. So, um, particularly for major developments, um, you could find that the, the development is contrary to some policies in the plan, but generally consistent with the allocation. Is it contrary to the development plan or not? Um, so, I, I think that it, it is not the case that you can always make a straightforward judgment. So the reporters will have seen cases where an authority has refused an application because it's contrary to the development plan and found perhaps actually it's not really contrary to the development plan, taking a different view. It's not a clear-cut judgment that, that's um, black or white. Um, and and so that that's another element of potential complexity around us. Uh, convener, um, for the record, um, I'd just like to say um, that the government is not favourable to equal right of appeal. 
um, or uh, Sorry, proposals what, what you for mean? limited right of appeal. And beyond that, we are not in favour of removal of the applicant's um, right of appeal, um, as I outlined uh, in my letter um, to the committee. Okay. Others in? Um, Time is pressing, and I'm open to members following up on some of that. I mean, we are about to close. Can I just check then, because the, our committee will have to sit down and look at the balance of evidence, and we'll decide what we decide in relation to this and we'll stage one report. Um, if the committee does not favour an equal right of appeal, um, how do we know there's been success in front loading in relation to this bill. I think where Deputy Vera made the point of the 2006 Act I may mean, not have did everything that it wanted to do in relation to, to front loading. Uh, how, how would we, so a committee, we asked this to other witnesses as well, so in 10 years' time, that's the length of, that would be the new length of a local development plan. If in 10 years' time, um, how would you know what success looks like in relation to front loading rather than equal right of appeal, and how would that be monitored? Uh, if this bill is, is passed? Well, I think, first of all, no matter what we put into play, there are still going to be inst instances pardon me, where people don't get the results that they want um, uh, from planning. Um, but we will continue to monitor very closely um, how planning is operating uh, and how our proposals uh, actually um, turn out in terms of performance management, uh, stakeholder satisfaction, uh, and how engaged people become. Uh, in terms of some other aspects uh, of all of this, um, I think that um, the committee um, should also be made aware, you know, if you move um, to a situation where you were to recommend um, uh, limited or, or equal rights of appeal, um, you are going to have to um, look at how um, that will be resourced by local authorities um, because there will be added costs to them um, in that regard. Um, I have no idea um, what that resource burden would be. Um, and that would divert resources as well um, from the upfront planning uh, and collaboration um, that I and, and, and many others um, would like to see uh, and could lead to a, a further um, gumming up of the system. OK, uh, I, th I think we've got a supplementary from Monica Lennon. Um, <coughs> on the, the issue of cost, um, Minister, what um, information can you share with the committee about the, the cost of developer-led appeals at the moment? Because we heard from um, industry witnesses a couple of weeks ago that uh, developers, in terms of major applications, are spending um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds on appeals, and sometimes legal costs are awarded uh, against local authorities. The DPA reporter makes a decision on that, and I know in North Lanarkshire that's run into hundreds of thousands of pounds. So have you looked at the, the cost-benefit side of that? Um, convener, I don't have the, uh, those uh, answers at the top of my head, and I don't think anybody would expect me uh, to keep that at the, at the forefront. Uh, what I will do is I will talk to DPA and others and see what, if any, information we can provide on that front. OK, thank you. Well, perhaps after three hours we can forgive you for not having that at the, at the front of your head. It has been a marathon session. I think it had to be, Minister, quite frankly. There's, there's a lot in the bill. Uh, we, we have to scrutinise every part of it. Can I thank you and your officials for attending here today? And we look forward to uh, uh, your response to our Stage 1 report at once drafted. Thank I you, appreciate Minister. the opportunity, and Convener. Thank you, thank you very you. much. Now, we do now move to Agenda Item 2. We have some subordinate, subordinate legislation in front of us. The Committee will consider negative instruments 46, 63, 64, 65, 74, 75, 76 and 77 as listed on the agenda. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that the provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes and motions to annul them. Uh, I can inform uh, members that no motion to annul have been laid, and can invite members whether they've got any comments in relation to the instruments before us. Mr Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I just want to put on the record once again my dissatisfaction that we deal with important uh, orders about tax, in particular the Non-Domestic Rate Scotland Order 2018, which is the second, uh, which sets a rate of 48 pence in the pound and is the second highest 
um, um, uh, tax raising uh, power this Parliament has that we, 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 uh, that we um, deal with these via uh, negative instruments, which I don't think allows for uh, sufficient scrutiny. OK. Now, you've put that... That's a consistent opinion you've, you've had, Mr Whiteman. You've, you've put that on the, 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 the official record here, what is now this afternoon. Um, that said, I'm wondering if the committee unanimously or otherwise, are we still going to agree to wish to make no recommendations in relation to these instruments? Are we agreed to that? OK, and of course, Mr White's points are now on, on the record. Uh, so we now move to agenda item three, which is uh, in private. Uh, so we now move into private session. Thank you.